From the Smith Radio Studios, it's Carrie and Brian Smith. This is Smith Radio. You can tweet at Smith Radio, S M Y T H Radio. And now, your host, Carrie and Brian Smith. You know, I'm just going to come out with it because I know everybody's been asking me about it, and I've been getting a lot of messages. That song, folks, uh, that song is by a guy named uh, Mark Houck with a band called So Ohio, like the old gas station. Yeah. So Ohio. Yeah. I don't don't ask me why they named it So Ohio. That's what they did. Well, and I mean, aren't they from Ohio? They are from Ohio, okay. but you cannot have the website soohio.com.net.info.org. dot com net dot info. Are you dot making org. fun of him right <laughs> now? You're making fun of him. <laughs> he, he's probably listening right now. Like, he's an awesome guy, but he absolutely hates Trump. And when I told him about the show, he, he's happy for us, and he's happy for the show. And he but, probably got excited when you you wanted to use the. Absolutely. The song, right? Absolutely. Okay. But he told me a story. He said that uh, the, the guy that holds the rights, because it was going to give him some money, like 20 bucks or 30 but whatever yeah, it cost. Dollar fifty. Whatever. To use it. And I mean, it's he, worth more than that, but that's just what our budget is. And so, so he got a hold of the guy, and they came back and like a couple of weeks later. He's like, oh, man, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> I'm like, what? He's like, oh, he's a real hardcore lib, and, you know, he just he's not going to like this. He's triggered. So he went back again, and he came back to me and said, man, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, what? And this is kind of somber. I mean, sorry, but tell you, but that's what happened. Guy got in a head-on car wreck and died. So we don't have anybody to pay. Wait, you is his the lawyer gone? No, his lawyer. Oh, the lawyer. I to, thought the To guy. take the money. Well, I mean, you know what they say about uh, <laughs> 100 lawyers at the bottom of the sea. Good start. Right. I, yeah. <laughs> it was all right. So look them up, So Ohio. You can find them on the uh, the iTunes or whatnot and okay. uh, on the go- on the YouTube. I, I will have to give you a caveat. Oh, gosh. Here we that go. is the only song I like. That's okay. one of the all only right. ones I know. And I'm okay. going to leave it at that. Because the rest of it is like rap, right? Or, no? It, it, it's, no? I mean, because it's hippie stuff. Yeah, that's true. It's like... Like an attempt at grunge, maybe? A, a grunge slash hippie. But I mean, anyways. But that's digress. a good song. Good this song. Fantastic song. So, uh, without any further ado, you're listening to Smith Radio, Military Veteran Talk Radio. I am your host, Brian Smith, along with... Carrie Smith. My cousin. And back in the 90s, we uh, I was in the Air Force, and he was in the Marine Corps. We've been talking politics for about the last 15, 16, 17 years, all the time, hours and hours on end. And back in 2012, we decided once Obama was reelected, we saw that this was over the event horizon, and that was it. It was all over with. We decided to come together and just document the demise of America and how it was falling apart at the seams. And... Because nobody's going to believe it a thousand years from now. Right. So it was audio only. This is our fifth year. We are in our fifth year, and this is our first year of video. And I want to uh, give a shout out to all our great Patreons. Thank you very, very much. It feels like we've been doing video way longer. Like I, I almost feel like yeah, there was a point in the in the early goings where we we it was just audio. But yeah, we're video. But no, yeah. you're saying that. We did audio for a long time, audio only for a long time. Yes, not only that, but we attempted video at, at one point in time. We attempted video I think using I something called OBS, Open Broadcast uh, Systems or something or other, okay. uh, using a PC. Ah! Hold on, though. You, do you remember, like, at first we were like, hey, what if we just <laughs> turn the Periscope on our phone? And just put it in the corner of we the studio. That. And so that was kind of our first uh, couple of uh It was the first video. attempt at uh, scoping. It looked like, you know, like the Rush Limbaugh show has the ditto cam. And as far as, you're like, a, you're literally a, a fly on the wall. Yeah, yeah in, in the, the sky. You're just looking down on it. Right. And he doesn't pay attention. So it's not like your traditional show. That's kind of like how the... The Periscope was at first. We were speaking into microphones as if we were on radio, and we just happened to have a video off to the side. But now it's more, a little bit more like and so personal. Now, yeah, and so now you can go to smithtv.com, smithtv.com. It's kind of a short little quick thing. Anybody, you know, you want to tell somebody about, uh, hey, you got to check out this show called Smith, Smith, Smith TV. Okay. Dot, right. com. I'm going to change our brand now. Is it? Smith, Smith well, adding to it, okay. the smithtv.com will take you directly to the website, smithradio.com, where you can see everything. The show is live on our website currently right now and will be saved for the entire week until next week's show. Uh, check out the new gear, all the new gear. You're not going to believe this, but patriotic leggings for the ladies. Oh, wow. 
a little bit of Marine Corps symbols, a little bit of Air Force symbols, and Smith Radio plastered on the side of the ankle. Okay. It's pretty awesome. And now we have the new Smith Radio. I even picked this picture up. This is the Smith Radio 2020, Trump 2020 Smith Radio, Keep America Great. Vessi tweets made that. Yep. That is now on the shirts on smithradio.com. Just look to the right. That'll be the shirts. I like it because it's just, um, you know, it's clear. You just glance at it and you see it. Whereas I think that, I don't know, a lot of our banners are just, there's just so much stuff jammed into it that you have to sit there and read it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, definitely. As opposed to just kind of glancing. Like if we tried to put that on a billboard, you'd get into a wreck trying to read it. (laughs) And yes. and so so I like the new design. It's kind of like something you could actually put on a billboard. Yes, absolutely. And we have a very special show, jam-packed show for you folks. We have three special guests that will be speaking at American Priorities Conference. If you look at the bottom of the screen, AmericanPriority.com. Folks, this is how we save America. This is how we keep it. This is how we save it. If you're angry and frustrated about all the negative, 95-plus percent negative news against Donald Trump, all the lies, all the hate, and we're going to get into that this week about the lies about Donald Don Jr., uh, uh, mm. Cohen, uh, weak need and falling apart. Uh, the, the, uh, Papadopoulos, your prayers, are, our prayers are with you, my friend. Uh, we'll be meeting up with his wife at American Priorities Conference. And so, if you're really sick and tired of all this stuff, you need to get uh, uh, grounded with folks like us at these conferences. You need to meet and greet and connect with everybody. Listen to the new uh, things that are going on, if you will, the grassroots movement, the RNC. The GOP is not doing this. They're no. very, very bad at this. What? And the DNC they, is so unbelievably... They would be okay at this if it was promoting an establishment, uniparty type person. Yeah, right. But not what the MAGA movement has become, which is like we the people trying to wrestle back America as it was founded. That's really what it boils down to. No, correct. Absolutely. And when we went to the uh, Eagle Gateway Council uh, conference out in St. Louis, uh, they it was unexpe- They were unexpected. They didn't realize that a bunch of youth was going to show up and uh, uh, just kind of take over. This is the new blood coming in, and it was it was well received. It was well oh, welcomed yeah, they and were well very, received. Yeah, they were very nice about it. They seemed a little bit um, surprised, like they. Well, this seems like a little bit of a different demographic this year. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. It was uh, cotton tops and the rest of us. I mean, it's pretty much what okay. it was. We brought a low energy soy boy Antifa. Uh, that was uh, good times. But here's the thing, folks. We have our own council now. We have our own con- uh, uh, American priorities. We're getting together. This is going to be at a very minimum a yearly, but we're pushing for a, uh, what is it, biannual, a twice a year uh, okay. event. So I never can figure that out. Was, is biannual twice a year or once every two years? Somebody needs to comment. I think it's Let bi- me know. Bi- but anyways, okay. we're shooting for twice a year so that we can make this more of a, a, a bigger event, a more mainstream event, something where you can get plugged in and learn how to do what it takes to save your country. And it turns out that it turned into a mainstream event. You know, when we first uh, talked to the, the creators of this event, it was kind of like, oh, it's like, you know, like a if you were to take the Deplora ball and like turn it into a CPAC. And right. And so it was kind of like going to be that kind of a get together. Well, as soon as people started to find out that this was uh, going to be very professionally put on and, you know, it it is uh, going to have it. it, I'm really excited about the kind of breakout sessions, the kinds of people that want to to donate their their expertise on these matters. and, And boom, just like that. Uh, everybody wants to be a part of the show, and it's right. it's awesome. So now, um, it's it's turning into the who's who. It's much much bigger than what I thought it was going to be, which was kind of like a deplorable CPAC type thing. So that being said, the sky's the limit. So it's going to keep growing, and but you don't want to miss the inaugural, right? The nope, very first annual. Absolutely not, because everybody's going to be talking about this forever and right. ever and ever. Uh, and our special guest, our first special guest, slated to come on. 
uh, here at the bottom of the hour is uh, Scott Pressler. Um, awesome. Martha Barnes is scheduled. She was scheduled for last week, but she had a power outage because of all uh, the ice storms that happen around the country. We almost didn't get to go on the air today. Just uh, flat out power outage. And we were just like, why? It's sunny. It's oh. sunny, beautiful, 66 degrees out in Cincinnati, one of the greatest, most beautiful days that we've seen in for I can't even tell you how long. Power goes out at 145. and uh, elect- why wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it? <laughs> electric Company says it'll be back on at 345. I said, no, no, I need the time at the show prep, the show prep with the cell phone. And, uh, hmm. and, and lo and behold, electricity came back, but Internet didn't. And then oh, uh, gosh. <laughs> 40 minutes before uh, showtime, I got the internet. I was literally using my cell phone connected through hey, USB Lord. Oh gosh! To, to navigate the internet. So this show brought to you by Apple. All, okay. Ap- all Apple products, I mean, man. I, I do have an you. Apple product, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, There's I'm no struggling. way you could have done this with a PC, and I found out that when you use an Apple and you open up the, the, the web browser... It uses a fraction of the RAM to operate, whereas a PC, and this is not just not me bashing PC. This is yeah. a fact. Mm-hmm. PC's uh, browser, when you open up, it uses a percentage of your RAM. So it doesn't matter. So if you have you eight gig of RAM, say it uses one. If you have sixteen gig of RAM, it mm-hmm. uses two. It sounds like uh, the algorithm that Twitter uses for your following. If you get 300 new <laughs> yes. followers, you will lose 150. Yes. If you get 10 new followers, you will lose five. Uh, that's, it's exactly half every time. That's a fact. It's guaranteed. It is unbelievable. Not only that, but the people that unfollow you, uh, ironically, uh, are Trump supporters as well, which is well, yeah, because crazy. it's not like we have a bunch of liberals following us that are like, oh, you mean this guy <laughs> likes Trump? And then unfollows you. It's just I'm it's shocked ridiculous. he's a Trump supporter. Yeah, that's just not the case. So for for 250 people to unfollow you because 500 new people followed you just seems utterly ridiculous. Right. And Deanna Lorraine, who was on a show last week, just an incredible guest. Uh, she before the show, she uh, texted me and said, hey, you know, this is strange. Every time I go back to your guys' uh, Twitter page, I got to follow you again. Uh, I've never had anybody actually say that to me before, but I've had the strangest Twitter experience out of everybody that I know. Nobody has gone through what I've gone through. I mean, what's well, that? I mean, maybe me a little bit. Uh, probably, but uh, actually, probably exactly. I think we're going through the same thing. But but check this out. What company is it that gives you that big graphic tweet that says, "This is how many impressions you've had this week." And it'll be like a couple million or something like that. I don't know what company does that. I don't know if you sign that up with me. But but periodically, I think once a week, a tweet will come out from Smith Radio that will show a big graphic. It's like a, an attached image that has the, the number of impressions you had that week. And there was one week. It's usually close to 10 million for me. And there was one week where it exceeded 10 million. And I had a net gain of, I think, negative 50 followers that week. (laughs) And I was just like... You were doing too much. (laughs) I I was getting thousands and thousands of likes and retweets, 10 million impressions, and nobody in the entire... Like, 62 million people voted for Trump. How many of those people that voted for Trump, the 64 million, uh, however many it was, how many of those people have a Twitter account? And... It's just, it's, Twitter is obviously shadow banning, not just us, but a lot of Trump supporters. And then you got the the fact that they're banning people for no reason. And so that's what's happening on Twitter. But anyway, I digress. Uh, Yeah, we lost one, my millennial. He's no longer on the Twitter. But he... He deleted his own account. He deleted his account. Because I said, delete your account, and he took it literally. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) I, I actually said delete your account. Come on, kids. This, this is jokes from the old oh, folks. I felt so bad. I was like, Can I, should I call him? Should I, should I reach out to him? I felt so bad. You know how those kids are. I don't know. There's millennial, and now we've got Generation Z. Which I think is 
slated so far, they're on par with possibly being the next great generation. Yes. The I'm greatest. hoping so. Fingers crossed. That would yeah. include our daughters, right? Yeah, 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 because they're the first. I'll tell you what. They're the first generation that – I've ever heard of him definitely in my lifetime and maybe in the past century or so or more where there's a significant portion of them either being corrected when they get home by their parents. When they get home and they've been brainwashed by the the communists that run the Department of Education and they come home and say, mommy, mommy, we learn blank, 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 whatever. We're like, what? And then we correct them, and they're skeptical. Either that, or they're just flat-out homeschooled. When I was growing up, there were rumors of kids that knew somebody that may have been homeschooled. Yeah, But we we didn't didn't believe them. We didn't believe 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 them because that would have been like – what? You mean you wake up in the morning and, and you, you don't t- go to school? And you stay home? It was like, <laughs> I would dream of that every day. It's like going to go down the street and look for a unicorn. It just ain't happening. It's just not, or, you know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, whatever. <laughs> and and so it was a rumor. And now, like, my wife is a president of the local chapter of the American Heritage Girls, and like the entire troop is homeschooled. Right. And then Brian here not only is homeschooling his three children, but he's part of this other group that's completely independent of the American Heritage Girls uh, chapter that is just a huge homeschool group. And I'm just like, wow, this was not the case when I was growing this up. Is, there's a, there a mega church on the, I don't know, uh, the Coleraine area. I mean, west side of Cincinnati. Uh, mega church with, uh, when I say mega church, I mean uh, all kinds of rooms, like dozens and dozens of different offices and do- dozens and dozens of different classrooms and rooms and I mean, it's a mega church, big church. And they said that they were praying for months, maybe years. Uh, God send us an organization uh, that homeschools that needs a, a place to facilitate oh. their schooling once a week so that the, the, the kids can uh, take electives or whatnot. So my daughter takes astronomy and the other daughter takes uh, um creative writing and, and then there's art classes and science and stuff that you wouldn't normally do and they and and the the mothers usually the mothers all volunteer to teach a class or to do a class and since my wife is fluent in Spanish lo and behold she teaches Spanish class okay and this thing has grown and I mean there's when I went there for the final event there were hundreds of kids everywhere wow. ranging from my boy, who's four and a half, all the way up to high schoolers. Yeah, and and that was originally how schooling was done in America, where it was like you'd have these little schoolhouses that the local in the church. kids would. It, it could be church or it could be they would just build something, and then the kids would walk to school, and it was there was not like um, you wouldn't be arrested for truancy or anything like that. Uh, because in the, you would want to go anyway, and then it was like local mothers or whatever, or somebody that that had the time to go every day to do to teach the kids and it would be like like there'd be a six-year-old and a 13-year-old it would be all oh, mixes. Yeah. a little house on the prairie yeah and so <laughs> and and you, you most people today would look at that and be like gosh that must have been inefficient they must have been totally ignorant they didn't know anything blah blah but you look at what we're being taught today and it's like wow it was probably much better because like what you learn today is just completely useless well look at what we look at what happened through the the uh, the 20th century all the inventions all the incredible technology that was created that wasn't created uh, by the Department of uh, Miseducation, right. which was implemented in 1979. Jimmy Carter, thank you, Mr. Peanut, decided that, that the, the it wasn't a department, decided that education should have its own singular department by itself and be funded totally by itself. It turned into the Leviathan that um, where everything has to go through them. And, of course, the Democrats get a hold of this and say, well, let's implement the communism this way. And that was also around the same era that big unions were destroying uh, car unions. They were destroying the car industry. They started employment. They wound up destroying Detroit City, which was a Detroit City literally in all of human history had more money flowing through that city than any, any single city in human history. Right. Folks. And that was destroyed. I did, 
All the city council members are Democrats. All the union bosses running the places, doing what they did. There's no coincidence why it was destroyed. I'm just saying. I mean, well, socialism fails every Every single time it's tried. And, uh, you know, it's uh, whenever it's faithfully executed. Yeah, when it's faithfully executed. So when people say that communism and socialism just hasn't been implemented correctly. No, no, no. no. It has been implemented correctly. The end result is... The utter destruction. Right. Venezuela. You, know, you need some sort of – there's two ways that socialism can get by, can survive barely. Number one, there has to be – it has to be supported either A, by capitalism or B, which is funny because it's like it's – it's they're opposing ideologies. They don't really work well together. There's like a wall that separates them. So you have a – a capitalist economy that supports the socialism, which is kind of what we have in America, right? Yep. So they call it a safety net, but the safety net is so big that you know it's like instead of like the bottom ten percent just kind of get um, saved from being on the street and impoverished or whatever, it's more like the bottom forty percent or maybe even fifty percent actually. Uh, so it, it ends up being like able-bodied people are on welfare or whatever. Able-bodied people end up living off of unemployment indefinitely. And the other way that socialism survives barely is when you have some sort of an export or a free source of wealth. So, for instance, uh, in the um, in Europe, in some of the few places where where socialism is surviving. It's because they have a free oil export, right? So they're just like pumping endless amounts of oil out of the ground. So not only are they able to provide for their own energy by pumping it out of the ground, but then they're also bringing in money by selling it as an export. And so all that wealth and free energy is what what uh, fuels or I should say uh, helps prop up the socialism. But without that free energy or or a free export from the, it's not really free i mean you got to get it up out of the ground but that's a lot of wealth well and the problem is now in venezuela the problem is is there's no more water there's no drinking water but the thing is is that all the oil they were a booming up and coming new they couldn't even democracy that. Yeah. It, you know and it was up and coming in like 1998 1999 and then you know, stole it they have literally taken the oil reserves all the oil reserves, all the companies that were drilling and digging, the, all of them have been fired and been replaced with military personnel. That's who runs the oil. Wow. How are you going to fire the engineers that run the oil rigs, the oil companies, the refineries? They should have. They should have. You know, the thing about that, socialism is like the, the gov- well, communism. The government is in charge of the means of production. And in the case of Venezuela and and uh, some of the uh, uh, northern European countries that 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 the liberals like to tout as being, hey, look, socialism works in these countries. Um, you you almost need a third party to do the oil drilling. You don't want the government to get involved in anything because they're so bad at it. It was like the Soviet Union had a car company. <laughs> And there actually is a version, uh, one of the models is on display at Wright-Patterson Air Force Museum because they have an entire section devoted to the Cold War. And, oh my gosh, it was like a three-cylinder little lawnmower engine in this car, and they said that lots of people had to push their car to get yeah. it up hills. And yeah. So real quick, we're slated to have uh, uh, Scott Pressler on. He is a grassroots kind of guy where he's uh, on the ground, knocking on doors, making phone calls, uh, helping people to, to 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 figure out what it is they need to do to help get the word out, to get the vote out. Uh, we're going to be bringing him on in just a second. He's going to be a speaker at the American Progress Conference here. This coming week, starting Thursday, December 6th, 7th, and 8th, Carrie and I will be there, uh, 6th, 7th, and 8th, along with all the crew, all the, the usual suspects. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah all I mean, the deplorables. It's the who's who. Yes. And, um, whoa, we have a, a knock on the door there. Yep. And just before we bring Scott Pressler on, what I want to do is I want to. I want to play a uh, um, a video that he posted up this morning that is at the top of his uh, Twitter feed. And let me get this set up. 
And this is what he has at the top of his Twitter feed. And this is where I'm talking about grassroots, folks. This is selfless, um, t- spending time selflessly helping to make America great again. And this is what you can do, uh, your part, if you so choose. Here's Scott Pressler today. Okay, it is Saturday morning on December 1st, and we are a group of Trump supporters out here in our Virginia Beach neighborhood, and we're spending our morning picking up trash. And not only that, but we have wrapped presents and collected toys for tots. So we want to show that even after the election, even during winter, even during the Christmas holiday season, we are out here in our community giving back, making it a more beautiful place to live. So thank you so much to Jocelyn and Eli and Tara and Colleen for being out here today. Awesome, awesome. And we have our special guest, Scott. How you doing, buddy? Life's pretty good. Hey, 5347, right? Nice. Yes, yes, yes. We now have new new numbers for the what 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 race was that? For the Senate, Republicans right. control 53 seats in the Senate. We added to our majority and Democrats including the independents of the Wisconsin caucus with them are at 47. So, so you were helping you were helping with Mississippi and did you also get involved with the Georgia? Um, I, of course, you know, helped them. I didn't travel down to Mississippi, but no, I wanted every single person to know they had to vote in that Mississippi election. The Democrats, look, they're fired up. They're fired up even in red states. But the one thing that I did want to remind people of that's happening right now is there is an election in Georgia, the Georgia runoff for secretary of state on Tuesday the 4th. So everybody in Georgia needs to get out and vote for Brad Raffensperger, and also Chuck Eaton. These are two statewide races for the Georgia runoff on Tuesday that we need to win. And in Louisiana, there is a runoff for Secretary of State on Saturday the 8th, Saturday, December 8th. Please vote for Mr. Kyle Arduin, Republican in Louisiana. Now, do you? is there a way that people outside of these areas can help out? Absolutely. They can make phone calls. I literally, this is pretty much how I spend my free time, which is almost not. <laughs> I, I basically will ask people from all over the country, hey, will you call into Georgia? Hey, will you call into Louisiana and help get out the vote for these Republicans? And people will do it. See, this is what the Democrats have been doing for years. And in fact, I live in Virginia, right? And in 2017, we had Democrats take 15 of our House of Delegates seats. And that's because Californians poured in hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. And what they also did is had people writing in postcards, making phone calls all the way from the left coast wow. into our coast. And that almost sounds like what went down in Texas with, with uh, Cruz and Beta. Absolutely. And so we're taking a page out of the playbook of the Democrats And I'll tell you one thing that I'm going to be talking about at the American Priority Conference this next weekend is uh, I want to ask the RNC, the GOP, whoever I can get my hands on to listen to me, that we need to do a project like what we did, hashtag letters to voters. We had a great candidate named Josh Hawley in Missouri, and I'll never forget it. And he won. He won his race defeating ultra liberal Democrat Claire McCaskill. Mm. And she was the most vulnerable Democrat. We sealed the deal. And I had hundreds of volunteers across the country riding into Missouri from all over Maine, Mississippi, Florida, you name it. These people wrote letters into Mississippi saying, we need you to support our military by voting for Josh Hawley, support tax cuts by voting for Josh Hawley, support Missouri jobs by voting for Josh Hawley. And we did it. Wow. So let's learn, let's learn from the Democrats right. and their tactics against them to win. And well, we were, sense. Yeah, absolutely. And we were complaining when we opened up the show. We were complaining that the RNC and the GOP, for for whatever reason, I know Bill Still came out with a video and, and, and kind of – kind of highlighted how the, uh, the GOP had some issues, the RNC had some issues back in 82 and, and and promised never to be around the polls and never to get involved. It's something crazy that, that may be a conspiracy, may not be. But, but the thing is that they have not been effective. 
and getting the vote out. It, I mean, it was a Tea Party that took back 2010. It was a Tea Party that took back 2012. It was the Tea Party that took uh, that, that turned into the Trump Trumpocrats. Well, I'm going to respectfully disagree with you only Oops. because I actually think Ronna McDaniel is good for the GOP. And I'm actually really okay. glad that President Trump has rehired her. Okay. See, I, I worked for the GOP for the Republican Party. I was actually a regional field director. So I have a different perspective because we on social media, as you all know, we're, we're social media people. This is how we communicate. We get our energy in, and uh, we, we talk to each other and we strategize through Twitter. Now, uh, people don't understand there was a hashtag going on in uh, 2018, you know, defy history or lead right. Unless you go to that hashtag specifically, you didn't know that the RNC and the GOP were registering voters. Yeah, I had no idea. I had no Or doing all those things. So uh, I'm a, a man that does give credit where credit's due. And I do want to point out that uh, the GOP has been doing things like President Obama did as a community organizer, because that's what I was. I learned how to register voters, knock on doors, become a community organizer. So you're giving yeah. us hope. So, you, well, I mean, what you're saying yeah. right now to me is you're giving me hope that, that As- we're actually turning the corner and there's some, this uh, uh, the, the sunny days ahead. <laughs> No, there are. There, there are. I definitely, I, I want to give you uh, two perspectives. One, we're on the right track because I think it's important that I give you encouragement and enthusiasm and optimism because that's, of course, what you know me as. But number two, we have to be realists. We have to be realists that we lost the House. We lost several governorships, I believe seven. And we have to be smart and strategic and effective. And in order to do that, and again, this is what I'm going to be talking about at the American Priority Conference this next weekend, uh, we have to look at the 2020 map and say, okay, if we're going to keep the Senate, for example, I can already tell you right now, we're vulnerable in Arizona, Iowa, Georgia, and uh, Maine, and Colorado. That means that we need to start now, today, yesterday, right. registering voters in those five key states. And not only there, but guess what? Look at Alabama. Doug Jones is a Democrat in a red state. That is a pickup opportunity if I have ever seen one. And so everybody listening to the show right now, you need to, if you live in Alabama, visit your local Republican headquarters and say, I want to learn how to register voters which again is something that I'm going to be focusing on from now until 2020, teaching people how to register voters, how to do it the right way, how to do it the effective, strategic, smart way. And every single Trump supporter needs to be registering at least five voters to make sure that we win in 2020. Yeah, I got to contribute to what you're saying here for, you know, I'm the type of person that gets stage fright. I don't like to talk to strangers. I could never ask a girl out on a date. You know, that kind of, <laughs> like seriously, I was just, uh, that's the kind of person I am. And so this idea of walking up and knocking on somebody's uh, door that's you don't know who this person is or what they're going to say when they answer the door, what you're going to say or phone call. I can tell you that um, Brian help me. Excuse me. Help me through that because Brian's, you know, Brian has been in sales, you know, co- you know, cold sales. <laughs> he likes beer. Well, this is before he even had the beard. But no, <laughs> like Brian's gone through like literally cold call sales and that kind of stuff. So I was like, Brian, you got to help me through this. We got to do this. And we're t- this is GOP stuff, knocking on doors, trying to get people to vote for for your local uh, Republican candidates. And uh, we did it a couple times, and now I'm just like totally comfortable with it. Uh-huh. And I, I urge anybody listening that it's just try it. It's so not as bad as you imagine, because I imagine the worst. Yeah, well, it's something that Dan Bongino said this week in one of his podcasts that he was out on the ground. He was knocking on doors. He was making phone calls. And he called back to headquarters and said, hey, I know you gave me the list. Uh, four by four, he called it. The last They voted in the last four uh, last four times and, uh, and whatnot. And so... I'm going to these houses, but in between these houses, there are Trump signs, and I've knocked on those doors, and they said, no, no, I've never voted before, but I'm in. So you got to tell me what's going on. And, and Dan Bongino said, and this is why I say this, folks, it'll energize you to realize there are a lot of people out there that think like you that just yeah. won't get out and do what needs to be done. 
And I want to share with you, so back in 2015, before the presidential election of 2016, I, myself, as one person, registered 500 people to vote. Wow. Zero, zero. <laughs> now, to give you perspective and context of what that means, we had a statewide election in Virginia, statewide, entire Commonwealth of Virginia, that we lost an attorney general's race, the Republican lost, by 300 votes. Wow. So that means that if my 500 Republicans get out to vote, we could win a statewide election for the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, what that means to the viewers that are watching that are going, oh, I don't matter. One vote doesn't make a difference. One person doesn't make a difference. It does. Yeah. And it is the most empowering tool. I am empowered that I can create a Republican voter, motivate that voter, get them to the polls and help elect a president like President Trump is keeping his promises. And last thing, because I really I want to hammer this home. To every person that feels powerless or helpless, look at what we accomplished in Pennsylvania and Michigan oh, yeah. and Wisconsin. Nobody, yeah. not a single <laughs> pundit or pollster ever thought those three blue states would ever flip red for President Trump at a presidential election. And we did it, which shows you it's all up here, guys. Yeah. You have to think positively and it will come into fruition. But unless you think it, you'll never act it. No, you're 100 percent right. Yeah, when I saw Pennsylvania fall, yeah, me too. I, it was it was it was emotional. It was that landslide emotion that I felt. Um, if if we're to win, uh, it's something else that it's been coming up the past couple of weeks after the midterms that I'm having some issue with, and I've seen other people tweeting out about it. Uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Sam Keels on Twitter, uh, made the comment that uh, GOP, uh, watch out. Uh, you're not fighting back with these these fraudulent claims, uh, recounts. Uh, Democrats have won every single recount, uh, whatever's going on in, in, in Broward County and all this stuff. It doesn't feel like uh, the Republican Party is engaged in a sense that they're ready to fight back against this garbage. I just don't think the Republican Party does a great job of touting itself. Okay. Uh, okay. So that's what I want to hear. <laughs> I think that's more what's really going on. Like, for example, I mean, look at what President Trump, the, the reason why I love President Trump's rally so much is because President Trump is a great PR marketer for himself. He's able to go out there and tout, you know, we have the lowest black unemployment in history. We nixed the Iran deal. We have an embassy in Jerusalem. We have uh, members of the UN actually paying their fair share, you right. know, <laughs> I just love that President Trump is a good PR marketer for himself, and I feel like the GOP could use a little bit more of that, of actually pushing out and touting accomplishments and accolades, showing the American people the value of its organization and really why somebody like me should be contributing to the GOP. Absolutely, and, and now that you say that, um, uh, I, I have Rhonda McDaniels on notification and this week, she she tweeted out a couple of different tweets that were uh, numbers and and uh, pro pro America. They they uh, she one she listed out uh, unemployment lows, GDP, all kinds of different uh, bits of information of things that are going on, the strength of the economy. And I, I really like the way that she's gone about it. So, yeah. it, it just comes down to look. I uh, after the election in November, I had to take a moment because. Everybody knows who knows me. I was so laser focused on the midterm elections. You have no idea. Everything was Tuesday, November 6, 2018. Tuesday, November 6, 2018. <laughs> and after that election was over, I had to stop and think to myself and re-engage. Okay, Scott, what's next? What are you going to focus on like, like a laser beam next? And the two things I always think about are respectfully – I don't want anybody to have a vacant seat, but respectfully, I always think of Breyer and Ginsburg, because if we truly want to change history and remake the judiciary, then having a seven to two majority in the Supreme Court is a pretty big deal, oh, which yeah. means that right. we have to reelect President Trump in 2020, which means that we need to have a Senate to be able to confirm anybody. So I always think of everything very 
my mind reads like a chessboard. I think of, okay, if I ultimately want to take somebody's king, what are the X, Y, Z steps that I have to do in order to get there? So right now, I wanted to really make myself uh, a marketer on how to teach people how to register to vote. And that's exactly what I did. I made a plan and I made a PowerPoint. And I was fortunate enough to get connected with Alex and Dr. Jane and y'all with the <laughs> yeah. Asha on the American Priority Conference. And now here I find myself going to the American Priority Conference to talk about voter registration. So it really, it, it's about what is the need? And normal, average Joes like me can see that need and go, okay, let's be a problem solver instead of a complainer and create a solution. That's what we need more of. These people on Twitter less tweeting, more action. And if you're going to tweet more, then act more. That's my only rule that I have. Oh, Sam's going to love to hear that because really that's what it boils down to is is what it's action. It's getting up and actually doing the thing and taking the steps and, and just putting your first foot forward to make these things happen. Because when you complain, it's almost like you're saying, hey, listen, somebody needs to do something about this, not me. Somebody else. Somebody else needs to do so. But really, it starts with yourself. And if everybody Absolutely. just says, I'm going to do my part, then all of a sudden you start to see the big changes. This is the reason why there are so many President Trumps. I mean, excuse me, so few President Trumps and so many Angela Merkels. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> so, few, <laughs> so few people are actual leaders and so many are followers. And it doesn't take a lot. I uh, And I, I don't ever mean this conceitedly or that I think that I'm full of myself, but I'm proud that me as one guy standing on a street corner with a sign that said 3.6 million black kids in poverty, why do Democrats choose legal aliens first? That has been seen by millions of people and has even be, been tweeted out by people like Charlie Kirk. So I know that one person standing on a street corner literally helped change the world. Yeah. And it, it, it may take a while to get that through your head or to even fathom that you have that power, but we have insane power. Right. It's just about honing it and saying, I can. And I know that sounds cliche and you can laugh about it, but literally it's the power of the mind and getting into yourself, positivity, enthusiasm, excitement, optimism, and the ability to say, I can, I will, and I'm going to. And that's something else I've said in some of my scopes here recently. Uh, I know I've been getting a lot of people talking to me about uh, they're frustrated with, with all the, the anger and the violence, and they're frustrated with uh, you know, no justice for those that uh, need to come to justice. Yeah, like the deep state people. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and they're really frustrated and angst, and I, I, I share your frustration. I understand, and I always say, you know, in due time, God bless America. It, it's going to happen at the right time, at the right place. But if you're feeling that right now, get engaged. And once you get engaged, you'll realize that that kind of stuff falls away because you know it's just rhetoric, it's just BS, it's just them uh, lashing out because they got nothing else. And know that you're doing something to move the ball forward. Or like, for example, everybody was saying, Scott, we lost the house. We lost the house. We lost the house. And they're all focused on that. So I put things in perspective. And I have put out all of the governorships that Republicans have won, which include, by the way, the impressive list of New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Maryland, Georgia, Florida. And that is a small part of the long list of governorships. And they were like, OK. And I also said that, look, we increased our majority, which hasn't happened for decades of a uh, controlling party actually winning seats in the Senate as opposed to losing them. We added to our majority and they were like, thank you for putting things into perspective. So as a community, it behooves us as leaders to when people are feeling downtrodden or they're focusing on the voter fraud or they're focusing on the negativity, we have to be that source of inspiration to actually put things in context and go, no, we, we did. Oh, Hey, there's room to grow. Let's focus on where we did poorly. Let's focus on, on where we did well. Let's focus on where we need to be in 2020. No, absolutely. Uh, working forward to 2020, uh, picking up more seats in the Senate, very possible. Uh, taking back the House, 
I think very, very possible. Uh, uh, not only that, but I, I know this may be kind of weird, but uh, the fact that we lost the house, I think, has energized a lot of people to say, oh, man, I could have done a little bit more. Yeah. I could have got a little bit. Man, it right. was so close. Maybe I could have knocked on one door more. Maybe I could have given one more weekend. So I, yeah. I think there's more energy coming out of this. I think it, it, the fact that we were having so many successes, and I was worried about this for a while, and I'm actually worried about it for 2020 for re-election for Trump, is that people are like, oh, my gosh, Trump made America great again. It's so much better. We have all these positive you know, m- metrics that we can point to. And everybody just goes about their, their life and enjoys the, the great America that they live in, not realizing that they have to fight back when the Democrats try to roar back and, and take it back. And, and not to... Like, they forget about how bad it was. I actually have to remind myself, we founded this radio show, which is now like a TV thing now, that uh, because of how bad America was under Obama. And I have to actually physically remind myself, like, man, do you remember how bad it was? And when we stopped, when we stopped doing what we needed to do, I think in the 90s, we weren't doing what we needed to do. And and I know Bush was elected and whatnot, but... Uh... Uh, they're kind of juggling on that. And we didn't do what we needed to do to expose Obama for who he was. And I, I, I mean, myself included, we, I, we, I fell asleep in the nineties on politics yeah. and I, I really, really woke up uh, after nine 11. And at that time, the media had too much power destroying Bush and forcing the reelection or uh, forcing the election of Obama as historic, and you know, that's why you got to do it because Chris Matthews got tingled down his leg. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just saying, how do you beat that? And, and, and you know, McCain, and God rest his soul. Uh, I feel like he was a placeholder. Mitt Romney, a placeholder. It was just. Well, you know, we we have to look at history. History repeats itself, and we had Reagan for two terms, and then we had Bush Senior. Correct. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a quote that I want you to always remember to everybody that's listening. And I may screw this up, but hold on. You could paraphrase it. <laughs> it's basically great men create good times. Yeah. Good times create weak men. Mm. Weak men create bad times. Bad times create great men. And just like your radio show, how a bad time created something good. Now what we're seeing is people saying, wow, things are good. I don't have to fight as hard. And, and I'll tell you, I was talking to my mom and dad the other day, and I said, Ma, I said, I'm frustrated <laughs> because I'm young, but this battle is never going to end, and I'm going to have to fight until I'm an old man until the day I die. And she goes, you know what? You're right. And that's just the fact of the matter. This, this isn't every two years. This isn't every four years. I'm going to be battling the Democratic National Committee until I die. And that's just the fact of the matter. Right. Winston Churchill would never have been elected during peacetime. Ever, ever, never, 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 never. And then Reagan said that uh, we're only one generation away from losing freedom. And so that's what we're talking about, about fighting for your whole life, because right. there's one generation comes along and we get another Barack Obama. <laughs> Ulyss- Ulysses S. Grant would never, never uh, been been appointed power if it weren't for. Uh, dire oh, yeah. times, yeah. you know, and and we've said on the show many, many times before that it took eight years of Obama. It absolutely took eight years of because yeah. we were we were accepting uh, Mitt Romney. We were out there on the in the field knocking on doors. We accepted Mitt Romney. We said anything but this, <laughs> and and God said, Nah, man, nah, I got him coming. It's just, <laughs> it, it's just not no. ready yet. And so, I just I, you know just pray about it, and move forward. But yeah, it absolutely took eight straight years of Obama, and it took the threat. The absolute uh, historic threat of Hillary Clinton uh, yeah. getting a hold of the reins of this thing. Oh, Lord. Well, and I also want people to think of the silver lining. There are a couple examples of timing being everything. And you just mentioned Mitt Romney, right? Uh, look at what happened with him losing in 2012. And who would have ever thought today he would be the senator-elect of Utah? Right. And Look at the wonderful state of Kentucky, where me, you're talking to 
I am a Trump Republican, but I also have a very healthy Tea Party vein in me. I am a troublemaker. I am. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> I am a definite troublemaker. Yeah. And in 2014, I wanted Matt Devin to primary and beat Mitch McConnell. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, we, we fought today, hard for that. We fought hard for that. Today, a me, a Mitch McConnell supporter for helping to get us in two Supreme Court justices. True, true. And uh, 59, I believe, uh, district judges and 23 circuit court judges. And we have the governor of Kentucky, who is Matt Bevin. Yep. So it just shows you that everything <clears throat> happens in its time for right. a reason. And we just have to not only, I call it faith plus action. It's not good enough just to have faith. Faith is good. But you have to act on that faith. And when the two are coupled together, that's when you create magic. 100%. And, and just, just saying this, uh, uh, J- Jeff Flake, I know you're not listening because you get upset about the show. And uh, Tim Scott, I don't know if you're listening or not, but the two of you together, you're not going to stop the movement. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Jeff Flake. You're not going to you, – you've got five weeks left, and whatever it is you think you're going to do, so be it. And, get, folks, you can't get upset about Jeff Flake. He is what he is. It, you know, my favorite uh, movie growing up, you may have seen this. It's called Labyrinth. That's what David yeah. Bowie used to do. <laughs> what do you mean? Show. What do you mean that was our era? That's Gen X era. <laughs> and uh, I love that movie. And what I keep thinking about is at the end of the movie, when he thinks that he's won, David Bowie uh, thinks that he has all the power, that he has the control over this girl. And she turns to him and she goes, you have no power over me. And I always think of that when I think of Jeff Flake, <laughs> because <laughs> he thinks that he has all this control. Meanwhile, we're going to pass all of these uh, circuit court judges and district judges, all the ones that we want as soon as you're gone. So really, you're just stopping. You're just uh you're moving the inevitable just a few weeks back. Right. And so some of the numbers that are coming out that Donald Trump in two years has placed more judges, circuit court judges than than any other president in, in history. Right. Uh, yeah, it's historic. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't know how true some of these reports are, but. Bill Still, I, I go to Bill Still because, I, hey man, he's he's got a lot of connections and uh, he's usually not wrong. But uh, there's some rumors out there that Ruth Bader Ginsburg is is probably finally going to uh, seek some help. Uh, I think she's got, she's got some ailments going on and maybe spend some time with the family come the new year. That being the case, if you guys think that the Kavanaugh thing was bloody, <laughs> if you think that that was rough. You ain't seen nothing. (laughs) (laughs) Because you haven't seen anything when we're going to replace respectfully. Respectfully, yes. Yes. It happens because I always want to point that out. Yeah. And when uh, we need to take the high road, and as leaders, we set the example for the community. And so when Ruth Bader fell down the stairs, which was awful, dreadful. I was one of the first ones to come out and say, we wish her a speedy, swift recovery. Because look, she's a grandma to somebody. We all have a right. grandma. We don't actually wish ill will or anything. Right. Any- but with that being said, we have to prepare for the future and make sure that we have a Republican Senate majority and that we are able to uh, replace any vacancies with a conservative constitutionalist on the Supreme Court. So do you think that, you know, we gain seats in the Senate. Do you think yeah. you think that it'll be a worse fight? Because I, I think that because of our gains in the Senate, it almost feels like the argument can be made that the only reason the Kavanaugh fight was so bloody was because, you know, the Senate's pretty close. What was it, 51, 49? Yeah, oh, it's right, right there. Yeah, yeah, so it's kind of like all we needed to pick up is two uh, Republican votes and we can stop Kavanaugh. So it became bloody. But with the Senate in the numbers that it is now, it almost seems like a t- Total loss cause, right? What, no, no, no. In my opinion, though, the <laughs> Democrats, because they know they can't win it, will scream oh, louder. <laughs> well, I actually agree with both of you. <laughs> I think, no, 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 seriously. I think um, Brian's correct that they're going to scream even harder and bang on more doors. <laughs> oh, and they no, claw. And, they claw at the door. <laughs> try to pry. Open the door. Um, And they're going to have more people like Julie Sedwick, who apparently attended nine rape parties and kept going to the rape parties and kept going until it happened to her. I I mean, I think it's going to be an even bigger circus. But with that being said, we have now 
a buffer zone. Yeah. We yeah. have if Romney, Susan Collins, and uh, Murkowski all flake out, three flakes, if they all flake, then we can still win with 50 votes and Mike Pence serving as the tiebreaker. So right. I agree with both of you. Yeah, okay. Well, solid. That's awesome. So we'll still win no matter what. <laughs> I'm hoping. Yeah. And so uh, th- with with the Senate pickup, this is so great. Trump will have his first choice. You know, the Kavanaugh thing, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, it's been uh, rumored, very, very uh, credible rumors, that Kavanaugh was McConnell's choice and uh, and that McConnell told Trump that – the only way we're going to vote on anybody th- before the midterm yeah, if you want is it if done, it's Kavanaugh. Right. If you want it done in time, a quick fashion, it's I'll make this Kavanaugh. happen. We can get Kavanaugh in. Which which was probably maybe Trump's second or third choice, so he couldn't get his first. With with this Senate majority and everything the way it is now, we'll get Trump's first choice for sure the next time around. Uh, and this is the art of the deal. Trump is a smart businessman negotiator. He knows how to get things done. Because ultimately, look, we're not thinking one move ahead. Like I said, this is chess. You're thinking down the line. What do I have to do to set the pieces of the puzzle in order to get to the prize? And so if he wants Amy Barrett as to replace uh, a vacancy and he has to get in Justice Kavanaugh, who I think has demonstrated that he's actually a great family man and a good constitutionalist, then he has to get him in there. I'm all for it. Do what you have to do legally in order to win and to preserve the movement. Right. Well, because you know that the Democrats will do everything they can yeah. legally and illegally. To yeah. win. They will. They will. <laughs> you know, I, on fair terms. Right. I said, you know, fight fire with a volcano. I made <laughs> it. Right. <laughs> I made an analogy uh, the other day amongst my little circle of friends that uh, the Democrats are like, it's like playing a family board game, you know, family night, and you're playing against somebody who <laughs> is nonstop trying to break every rule and cheat. <laughs> Who's that? And anytime, <laughs> yeah, uh, not naming any names, <clears throat> uh, Brian, <laughs> or, or anybody else, but, but they demand that you show them in the rule book where what I just did was not allowed. And then you got to go through. Oh, I, I don't do that because I know it ain't in there. <laughs> well, and here's the thing. When you finally, either A, you're like, well, I don't know. And you, and you give up and you don't want to stop the game to look for the rule that they're breaking. Or if you do find the rule and say, listen, you look, you just broke the rule. They say, oh, okay, well, fine. And then, and then you go on. And he accepts that he broke the rule, but he doesn't have any consequences. And it's like, nah, stop. that's what the Democrats are. They break every law. They demand that you point out where they broke it. And then when you finally do, they're like, okay, fine. And then they move on and nobody goes to jail. Nobody gets punished. Uh, that Rockefeller, uh, he had a saying, he said, if you ever want to make your kids good and great and really sharp, whenever you play games with them, cheat. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Wow. Well, it's, it's another wow. element of the game. It's an element of the game that nobody realizes if you're not looking for it, you'll never see it. Oh, boy. I don't know. <laughs> go, ahead, go ahead, Scott. What do you think? One fighter who I really respect is uh, Senator-elect Rick Scott because he did fight against the voter fraud, and he did say he was going to do everything in his power to stop the Democrats from trying to steal the election, and he won. Right. He mm-hmm. allowed the Democrats to do it. He reassured and affirmed himself. And look at what he's doing now. He, after Brenda Stipes tried to sneak her way out of resigning out of her uh, supervisor of elections, Governor Scott was like, oh, no. And he suspended her. So now she has dropped her resignation and is going to fight oh. her pension because it all has to do with the pension the money oh she's right like, right gonna get that big she doesn't deserve it oh, hold on so if she gets fired it kind of goes down like mccabe you don't get I the pension so to my understanding if she gets suspended slash fired whatever then that big fat pension goes away they said so you- god i love that he's shrewd they they said that she's been getting paid her her paycheck is two hundred thousand dollars a year for the last 20 years That's too much money oh. Something oh, great. Like, yeah, I, the the number was two hundred thousand oh. dollars a year. Of, I don't know how many. I know it's at least a decade. So I'm just saying, uh, she's been pillaging down there for a long time. Well, I'm telling you right now, we uh, we've replaced 
Governor Scott has replaced her with, uh, his name is like Peter Antonacci. Uh, don't quote me on that, Antonacci. And we're now going to have a Governor Scott ally serving as the supervisor of elections for super democratic Broward County. So I'm saying this now two years in advance. Everybody is going to be very shocked, I think, by the numbers that come out of Broward County in 2020 and matching them to 2018 to 2016. Oh, oh, man. That almost sounds like uh, the, the key The key is to stop voter fraud. <laughs> <laughs> or, or not not let anybody run a Navis rental car the day of the vote. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. All right, Scott, any last, any last words? I, I know you're going to be speaking at American Priorities Conference coming up here. Uh, 6th, 7th, and 8th. Folks, I've had this up the entire time you've been speaking, Scott, but uh, his name's Scott Pressler. Just put the at symbol in front of that, and you'll find him on Twitter. One um, S. One S on press. Very critical. Yeah. Right. How do you, would somebody put two in there? Oh, I mean. Oh, it, oh my gosh. All the time. Some people put me? one T for Scott, two S's. I'm like, who raised you? Was Scott with one T? Like, <laughs> who <like>, raised you? <laughs> <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, uh, I'm really excited to be speaking at the American Priority Conference. Go to AmericanPriority.com. But no, I, I'm hearing we're going to have some amazing people like Boy yeah. Lewandowski, David yes. Bossi. They're going to be there with a new book about the deep state, which is real, talking about the players within our government. And, and to anybody that questions the deep state before we go on a different vein, look, look at Peter Strzok. Look at Lisa Page. We have people within our government trying to undermine our president, which means that people like you and me, the average American citizens that elected him, he needs us. He needs us to be firmly with him, supporting him, helping to register voters, helping to reelect him in 2020, because there are people that are trying to stop him and undermine him within his government. Right. You got Rosenstein, you got Mueller, you got Weissman, you got all these dirty dogs that are connected to the Democrats, the Comeys of the world, they're all connected. Uh, The McCabe's of the world, they're all connected. And this is what we, uh, uh, John Brennan, all uh, all these dirty, dirty deep staters. Uh, And that's why Trump needs us out here doing what we do. Absolutely. Project Veritas doing it. Uh, James O'Keefe doing what he does. We all got a, a, a small role, some, some bigger roles. Yeah. <laughs> some right. bigger, I'm signing up 500 new voters. That's, that's huge. But Scott would say anybody can do it. Just get out there and do it, right? Anybody. No, literally. And uh, I, I'm here right now at the home of a mom that loves her daughter so much and she was never an activist and she became one because she cares about the future of our country. And it's, it's amazing the stories of people that you hear with the amount of grandmothers, I I swear it's, it brightens my day. The amount of grandmothers that message me that say, I want my grandchildren to have the futures that I had growing up. What can I do? So I care if you're 16 60 or 90, every single one of us can be an activist and make a difference. Awesome. And so are you going to be there all three days of the conference? Absolutely. I wouldn't miss it for the world. I'll be there all three days. The hair will probably be down, so get ready. Oh, boy. (laughs) And Uh, how how tall are you? Are you six, five? How tall are you? I'm six foot five. Ah, I nailed it. I'm continuously to grow, continually growing. (laughs) Because every time I get in my car, it gets a little bit smaller. And I'm like, what the heck is (laughs) going And, and then I got the hair, which is like down here now. So I'm a I'm imp- pretty impressive to look at. You don't know what you're looking at. Is it like a Bigfoot? Is it a behemoth? I don't know. But I will be there. All awesome. right. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, we will see you here in a, just a couple of days. That's right. Folks, right. jump over and grab your tickets right now. All right. AmericanPriority.com. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Yes, Thank sir. you so much, Scott, for being on. Awesome. Wow. That was great, great, great. Incredible. Um, yeah, we hung out with Scott in St. Louis. Okay. Oh. <laughs> that was live. Close it. Close that was morning. live. <laughs> yeah, that was live. You're supposed to close it, Brian. supposed to close it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Oh my Good goodness. thing he didn't bust out with some cuss words right there. No, that's not Scott. No, that Scott's Scott not like that, that kind of guy. No, but absolutely, folks. Uh, we you, hung. We you hung. muted yourself. I did. I muted myself. So he couldn't hear you. Nope, nope. But I'm talking about it. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway. we hung out with him in St. Louis. It was a great time. Oh, it was Just, a lot of fun, folks. A lot of these people that you see that are on our show, even us. I, I mean, there was a lady that was uh, messaging me on one of my scopes that said that I'm driving 
to D.C. for the walkway march Yeah, from Missouri. I'll see you there. I said, well, come find me. Come look me up. Yeah. And she did. And we got to talk. And yeah, I remember that. You you introduced me to her. And I was like, um, uh, you, well, you introduced her as, as, a, as a fan of the show and everything. I was like, oh, that's cool. And it's it's we're all there. Yeah, we're all we, there. We can hang out. You find out where we're going to go grab something to eat at. We can hang out, right. have something to eat, and just talk and just chit chat and whatever. And it's all a good time. Everybody is there for a, a very similar reason. Whether you're a one issue voter or a multi issue voter, I promise you, you're going to find somebody to connect with. It really feels like family when we go out there yeah. and meet up with these people. And it's just great. Absolutely. Uh, our next guest um, in the other. Well, maybe. Next guest. I hope the next guest knows that we're on. Uh, when the next guest does come on, I'll let y'all know. <laughs> uh, I'm still kind of waiting on the next guest. I haven't heard back from her here recently. Uh, last week she had got uh, multiple confirmations on her from me- multiple different people. Yeah, but, uh, she had uh, electrical problems last week, and hopefully that's been fixed. Right. Okay. Uh, so this show, there's I got a lot of these videos. Uh, he was talking about. We we're talking about a lot of voter fraud. We we're talking about uh, you know. Um, what you can do and why we need to do it, um, where some of these things uh, lay at. And um, let's jump in real quick because I know this was kind of a hot button topic. I'm going to save uh, Laura Loomer and the Twitter debacle, the issue with Twitter and the people being banned on Twitter. I'm going to save that for our guest, Dr. Jane Ruby. Okay. Because she was there with Laura Loomer. She was the videographer. Yes. 1.4 million views on that video uh, that went viral. What was that? Definitely viral. Uh, t- Tuesday night, I want to think. Uh, I know it was very shortly after we had Laura on. Yeah, like we had on Laura on, and, on and, then, and then also I almost I'm I was going to say Tuesday, night. but it was a million views within less than twelve hours. Yeah, it I'm was, just saying it was rocking. Uh, when I checked it, like an hour after the broadcast was over, maybe two hours at the most, it was already at four hundred thousand views. So it went mega viral, flat right. out. So here's why we got to stay plugged in, folks. The caravan issue is big, and that's because the Democrats need a fresh new batch of voters. Why are they doing this? Why the chaos? Why the upheaval? Why why are they getting everybody triggered? Why does it seem like they're sticking their fingers in an electric socket and blowing the fuses? <laughs> why are the Democrats doing this? Because, folks, uh, the, the rules for radicals. Mm, okay. Rules for radicals. In the book, rules for radicals. First off, if you're not mm. in power, you must create uh, all kinds of havoc. Create all kinds of problems and issues, upheavals, create all kinds of turmoil. The more turmoil that you can cause and create, the better. Rules for radicals. So when that turmoil is created, all the angst and all the, the, uh, the, the, the protests and the uh, march of walk on the uh, sit on Wall Street and Black Lives Matter and Antifa, the more that you can do, then you come out and say, Elect us, we can stop it. We can make this go away. We can stop it. And in Rules for Radicals, they talk about how uh, people, citizenry, innocent, just regular citizenry that are peaceful, regular people, will want this to stop. And the more havoc that you can cause, the more problems that you can cause, the more that you say that you can solve them, the more likely... A peaceful citizen will vote for you out of the hopes of it really stopping. It's the theory. It's a theory. And don't think that that's not. Uh, I think it's been proven in practice. Yeah. Don't think that that ain't really happening. I mean, look at all the hell that we're going through. And you would think that people would be like, damn, I don't ever want another Democrat in power. You would think. I mean, here's the thing. I, I have to. I have to remind myself that not everybody is thinking about this stuff 24 seven like I do. It's not like everybody goes to work in the morning and puts on Glenn Beck followed by Rush Limbaugh followed by Sean Hannity on the radio (laughs) and uh, and then go home and and you know listen to all the different scopes and all the different YouTube channels that I'm subscribed to and 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 steams on this and even reads books 
on, you know, Enlightenment philosophy and the founding of our country and how it all happened and how it went down and all that kind of stuff. And this is what I've been doing for the past five, six years now. And I got to remind myself that not everybody has the time to do that kind of stuff or has the ability to do that. I mean, even now, like Brian has trouble catching some of the shows because of his employment situation right this second, whereas maybe a couple of years ago it was like, OK, and I'm even getting into that situation now where it's like, man, I haven't listened to anything all week. So it's kind of like I got to catch up on Twitter. But at the end of the day, there's a certain philosophy that our founders were well in tune to. That most people who believe in the Constitution, that believe in conservatism or, or their their version of it or their understanding of conservatism and the Republican principles and all this kind of stuff, it's it's not enough. It's it's not what you know. It's it's different than what the founders were thinking because the founders were thinking about this stuff all the time because they were being abused by their government and so. It's like we we try to we try to just keep people up to speed on this kind of thing, and um, oh, I hear some noise. <laughs> sounds like somebody. It sounds like somebody's there. Is somebody? Did somebody call us? <laughs> <laughs> I am hearing sounds, the, the things that go bump in the so, night. Okay, so before we have our next guest on, hold on, folks. Oh. Before we have our next guest on, <laughs> uh, we ran long with Scott, which was awesome. Great chemistry. Uh, just got a message from him. He's ecstatic at how things went. Great. I have a clip of Martha Bonetta that I put together of her. This will kind of give you a, a, a little bit of a, a flavor of who she is and where she's coming from. This is our next guest who will be at American Priorities Conference, Martha Bonetta. And here's her minute clip. And as you know, he touched the hearts and minds of of the West in, in our country, the heartbeat of America, the bread belt of America. For far too long, our farmers have been neglected and not given an even hand in trade all across our country. And our president promised to make American farmers first, and that's exactly what he has done. He's done that by evening the playing fields when it comes to tariffs. He's provided more opportunity also by deregulating the burdensome red tape that is so heavy weighs so heavily upon the American family farmer. And, uh, and the fact that our president has done so much for rural America by making rural America first, by making our American farmers first, by deregulating burdensome regulations, it's going to make a huge difference in these midterms and particularly in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The, the American people crave these opportunities to have one-on-one -on -one with the President of the United States and the Vice President. We just had the Vice President in the Commonwealth of Virginia and having the opportunity to have these rallies, to have these large town halls, the American people love it. They want to interact with our president. Many of them stand in line for hours and hours and hours for the for opportunity yeah. to experience <laughs> what I yeah. believe is you know, the greatest president in the history of our country. And with that being said, without any further ado, welcome to the show, Martha. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be on your show. Absolutely. Awesome. No, we are absolutely. This is our pleasure. Thank you so much. Martha is going to be speaking at the American Priorities Conference. Yes, and I am so excited. I can't wait to see everyone. Uh, let's see. We're having a women's luncheon with Katrina Pearson and uh, Dr. Gina Loudon. They are both uh, advisors to the president, um, surrogates for the president for 2020. And um, I'm just so excited to be uh, on a panel with them. And uh, it's going to be incredible. We also have Corey Lewandowski joining us, Dave Bossi, also advisors to the president. And they just came out with a new book called Trump's Enemies. And um, everyone that comes gets a signed, signed book from them. And they get to hear firsthand from Corey and Dave. And we have, uh, let's see, Anthony Scaramucci. Is coming oh, that's too. right. I forgot so, about that. Uh, Holy smoke. Yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> and there's a few surprise visits, a um, few surprise folks coming, but I, I, of course, it's a secret, so I can't share that. Okay. Well, that, you know what? Um, yeah. I'm sure that it's going to be a pleasant surprise yes, to everybody. Of course. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so, Martha, uh, what at the yes. women's uh, the, the women's luncheon, uh, is there anything in particular that you're going to be focusing on that you're going to be talking about? Sure. Well, you know, women in our country um, are the driving force behind our economy. And that's been the case historically. 
And now so more than ever, uh, you know, the, people always complain that President Donald J. Trump, uh, you know, not not uh, not fully understanding what he has done for women in our country. He has lifted up so many women. This is the lowest unemployment for women and minorities in our country in the history of our nation. And I'm so excited. What we're going to do in this panel is we're going to touch the hearts and minds of women all across our nation. We're going to give them the toolkits to go out into their communities, to entrench in their communities, to get other women fired up, to go out and vote and to support our president and to support candidates um, that, are, that support our president as well. Wow, that's incredible. We just had Scott Pressler on, and that's exactly what we were talking about. He's going to be speaking as well. He's a grassroots type of guy talking to people about mm -hmm. how easy it really is to make a big, big difference. And uh, just as long as you know. If you have the information, you know how easy it is, and you realize, oh, man, that's something I didn't even know I didn't even know. Now you know. Yeah, and I'll but tell you. you know, every, every day since President Trump has been in office, it's been like waking up and it's Christmas every morning. Yes. <laughs> you, know, like the movie, you know, like the movie Groundhog? It's like every day I wake up and I feel like it's Christmas. And it's because how many times do we all get tired of candidates that promise the world and don't deliver, oh, right? Our entire and life. That's where yep. our country – yeah. And here we have a president, promises made, promises delivered. You know, he promised he'd move the, the Israel embassy. He did it. He promised that we would have peace talks in the Korean peninsula and to denuclearize. He did it. And everybody said, oh, we'll never have a trade agreement with Canada and Mexico. And guess what? <laughs> what time is it? He I just did it. It just so, happened. <laughs> I mean, right. And so, you know, I... Uh, and it's indisputable. You know, when I, I speak all over the country and I sometimes I don't you know, I don't always talk to conservatives. I don't always talk to folks who are libertarian, right of center, Republican conservatives. I talk to people from every walk of life and even folks that did not support Donald Trump. It's indisputable that he's done more in his first 500 days than any other president has in the history of our country. And so um, we're going to have folks pumped up and fired up. This is a conference by the people for the people. And uh, let me tell you, this is the place to be in Washington, D.C. Folks are coming in from all over the country. So you're already there right now. Um, how's it look? Like, what, what are people going to expect when they when they show up? Is it going to be uh, it's going to be beautiful? It's absolutely stunning. Um, you know, this so much love has gone into this so much hard work and uh, everybody is, is just really excited and fired up everywhere I go. People ask me, you know, um, gee, you know, what time should we arrive? And folks are just really excited. You're going to see so much liberty bursting from that Marriott in Washington, D.C. Wow. It's, it's going to be something. We have all kinds of media that are going to be present. Uh, we're going to be doing live interviews right there. It's, it's really the place to be if you love America and you love this country and you love this president. That is the place to be. Now, I, I just saw on this website, it says you're the executive vi vice president of Citizens for the Republican, founded by Ronald Reagan in 77. How'd you get that gig? <laughs> I'll tell you. It's a good question. Uh, it's a good question. So um, I was not, you know, I, the, I feel so blessed and honored to have been asked by Reaganites. And, and you know, these include folks that served with, with Ronald Reagan uh you know, these are individuals that that were part of the Reagan revolution. And what they did was, you know, um, Ronald Reagan created Citizens for the Republic. And that was his way of doing what Donald Trump is doing right now, entrenching all over the country. And the, the organization Citizens for the Republic went dormant for some time. And with this administration, uh, there was so much excitement to to breathe new life into it, to relaunch it. And that's exactly what we did. And uh, I felt so privileged and honored. I'm the, I'm the youngest and only woman they've ever had in that role. Wow. And uh, it, it's been a privilege of a lifetime. I got to go to the Reagan Ranch and, um, and, re and really experience the, the place where, where Reagan, where Ronald Reagan and Nancy, you know, spent their time at the ranch in California and, and just have had the opportunity and the privilege of meeting so many incredible people. And, uh, you know, I truly believe that in my lifetime, I am witnessing every single day the greatest president of we've ever had in the United States of America. You know, I can't remember Ronald Reagan, so I can't speak to being um, engaged in that presidency because I wasn't. But I am here now and I'm seeing a great man deliver his promises to the American people every single day. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, the only p part that I know of Reagan 
is that uh, the people that where I grew up at, people that started a business in the mid 80s to uh, late 80s, if you started a business, a new business became wildly successful. I saw a lot of that. Uh, I remember and Carrie remembers this in the early 90s. Uh, right after all of that, you could get a job anywhere. Right. I, I would literally quit a job and, and because I just didn't like the boss or maybe I, I had issues I had to work on. But whatever, whatever <laughs> reason, I would quit a job knowing that tomorrow I could walk into another place and get another job. Right. I mean, jobs were plentiful and, and things were... I don't know. There America was, a, was great back then. Yeah. It was, yeah. it really was. And we even talk about racism. I don't remember that back then. It was race relations had, had gotten very, very good by the early to mid nineties. Very I think good. So. And, uh, uh Barack Obama, ah, uh, just kind of, uh, I remember thinking to myself on some of his actions, wow, I feel like he might be setting race relations back <laughs> 50 years. Yes. But anyway, I digress. I, I have a question well, I mean, for I, you. And I'll tell you, you know, Speaking of employment and jobs, yeah. you know, there is so much hope all across our nation. I mean, America is finally open for business yes. again. Yes. And, and you know, and we have a president who's making America first. He's making our veterans first. He's making our farmers first. He's making um, everybody first because he's focusing on our country and the great love that he has for this nation. I see it in him. I know you do, too. And uh, it's just a privilege to be able to. Uh, really witness firsthand all of the amazing things this administration is doing. There's hope all over the place in our nation, a great prosperity is ahead. And, you know, to witness so much excitement everywhere we go uh, is, is something, it's, it's an experience of a lifetime, I have, I have to tell you, and it, it's just going to get better. And the critics, the fake media, the haters, all of them, time and time again, they're proven wrong. And uh, and it's it's really been extraordinary to witness, you know, being here in Washington. I'm here where members of the administration and their families can't even go and have a dinner, you know, private dinner in a restaurant without being heckled uh, or harassed. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, and believe me, I am the strongest advocate for the freedom of speech. I would walk on burning flames and broken glass to protect our freedom of speech. But seriously, folks, can you just leave people's families alone <laughs> when they're having dinner? Right. I mean, there's a time and a place for everything. I mean, seriously. Well, and, Hillary uh, Hillary Clinton did say that uh, if you want that all to go away, just vote for her. Right. I mean, how how, <laughs> how outrageous is that? Maxine Waters. Yes. I mean, she, push back. She needs a she needs a timeout. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, I've never seen anything like it. It's so, bad. Uh, you know, but we're we're fighting back, and and I'll tell you, we are so strong. We are so strong, and you know, we're going to see even more great things to come. And I'll give you another example. You know, here, here we are, and we are witnessing firsthand that this president, you know, I, I am so tired of politicians promising the world and not delivery. Right. I know you, we've spoke of that. And, you know, to witness this president time and time again, you know, make make his pledges to the American people come true. It's amazing. And we need more uh, of, of these candidates to follow in, in those footsteps. I mean, maybe we should give him a I'm not even a three strikes and you're out rule, but you know, you make three <laughs> promises, you know, you break three promises and you're done. That's it. You're out. It for I, life. What do you think? Three strikes for yeah, life. <laughs> for for yeah, life. You three bomb, yeah. If you're, listen, listen, you heard it right here on this news show that if you're running for office and you make three promises and break them, that's it. You're done forever in right. politics. You that's can't, it. you can't you get can't back into good anymore. graces. Don't, don't, no. don't tell me that you're deregulating to, to get that's back right. in my good graces. Cause right. it ain't happening. Oh. That's right. You're done. You're just you're <laughs> toast after that. And you know, and, and you know, this administration pledged for every new regulation to wipe out two, right? But on average, it's been 21 to 22 regulations that have been thrown out for every new one. I mean, this is like a dream come true. I mean, this is this is a dream none of us want to wake right. up from because it's just been so great for the American people. Now, I th I think you are 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 you a business owner? For, yes. Okay. For some yes. I read so, something so, about that. So I own how I got involved is I own Liberty Farm. It was my childhood dream to be a farmer, and uh, I bought Liberty Farm. I couldn't wait to to you know worked really hard, sacrificed a lot to have to have a working farm. Um, to me, it's the it's the greatest profession in the world, the hardest I've ever worked in my life. Oh, yeah. I think every politician should spend a day mucking stalls on the farm. Yeah, you really should. If you can muck yeah. stalls on the farm, you know, and it's the greatest education I've ever had for politics. You know, I mean, mucking stalls. Let me tell you, you see a lot of muck here in Washington, <laughs> a lot. And um, 
but yeah, so, so bought the family farm, started working really hard and, uh, I loved it. I was just so thankful for the opportunity to live my childhood dream, to be a farmer. The next thing I know, the bad guys come in and they try and regulate me off the farm, threatened us with $15,000 a day if we kept our doors open. And, uh, it was terrifying. Absolutely. I had the alphabet soup of government agencies coming in and out of our farm, mm. harassing our family, demand inspections, shut us down when we were in full on harvest. Uh, and I'll tell you, I'm living, breathing proof that if we stand strong, we speak truth to power and we're not afraid, we will win. It took me 10 years, but we won. Wow. 10 years of fighting Congratulations. against the bad guys, but we won. Yeah, we changed the law twice in the, in the, in our Commonwealth. And, you know, we've created a uh, template for, for farmers all across our nation to know that, you know, property rights and freedom are inseparable. Freedom stands on the, on the shoulders yes. of property rights. And when the bad guys come on your farm and they try and take it away from you to stand strong and fight back and not be afraid. And, you know, we created a little tsunami. We had rallies all over our state. Then we started creating a national movement. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell everyone on your show that's listening, don't be afraid to fight back. Don't be afraid to speak truth to power and to know that, you know, we can and we will win. We just have to stand together and, and, and really fight back against overregulation. That's a burden on all of us. And, and if you guys are tired of the, the, the screaming and yelling coming from the left, turn the TV off. Don't listen to yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. You know, you come from a long line of politicians that end up going Republican, they're conservative, that started off as as business people who were abused by their local government and they That's said, right. you know what, I'm taking a stand and then they, I mean, they go into yeah, they go into politics. Uh Jim Renacy had that issue. He was being beat up by his local uh uh, yeah. regulations for his business and said, you know what? I'm ru running for Congress and he won in Ohio. And, um, That's right. yeah. So, so well, I'll tell you the, the bad guys, the radical extremist environmentalists that were in cahoots with the with local, local officials that started this whole thing. Um, boy, they sure wish they hadn't, they messed with the wrong <laughs> farmer. Let me tell you when I first started, I was so afraid to publicly speak and now you can't get me to be quiet. Nice. I mean, I speak all over the nation every day. I inspire and fire up people every day to fight back, you know, to, you know, small business. The, the, the best government is the government that governs least. And, you know, just get out of our way. Right. You know, let us live the American dream. Let us uphold what our forefathers um, planned for our great nation and get out of the way. And, and so I really, um, I'm living, breathing proof that the American dream is alive and well. It's worth fighting for and that we should fight for it. And I get calls every day from people all over our country that, are being overregulated out of their businesses, not just farming, but all kinds of businesses. And I tell them, don't be afraid. Go out there and fight. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll make sure you have an army of supporters with you and, and we're, we're going to win. We will win. We just can't give up. And it, it's just a story that was uh, in Indiana, a lot of tobacco grow uh, farmers in Indiana and Kentucky as well. But when you're growing tobacco, you need a lot, a lot of water. And usually mm -hmm. they have a pond or a lake or something of the sorts. And there was a guy that I knew that uh, got all the permits and regulations, uh, had it built and it was actually filled. I mean, that's how long this went. And uh, EPA came in and told him, said, if you don't fill that back in. 10,000 a day or whatever oh. it was. They fill it back I, you in. Can't he make this up. No, they <laughs> overrode the local. He did got all the permits. He did everything right. And the EPA wow. said, said, no, nah, man, no, nah, I don't think so. That's yeah. terrible. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's so egregious because, you know, our farmers really are the heartbeat of our country. Yeah. We really are. Built our nation. And, and, you know, we're making American farmers first. And the problem with the old administration, well, there's many problems, but the one problem. <laughs> That, that this president corrected almost immediately right out of the gate was the WOTUS rule, Waters of the United States, um, that, that was created under the Obama administration. Basically, the way it was written is that if you have a puddle on your land and it was navigable, you know, you could put a little plastic boat on it. And if it was navigable, it really meant that it, it didn't even belong to you anymore. So I mean, is that's that, how egregious and crazy. Yeah, I remember so is that. that. Why, is that why my, my friend got in so much trouble? I, I mean, it's, I don't know his situation in particular, right. but think about how egregious it yeah. is. That's awful. You know, I mean, and, and, and look, when the bad guys want to take your land, they don't have to come with a bulldozer. They can overregulate you off the land. They can make your life such a nightmare that you're forced off of your land. And I just want everybody to know that, you know, we're not going to let that happen. We're going to fight and fight and fight until I, I remember when I was going through this process and they shut my family farm down when we were full on harvest. And I, I remember thinking, this can't be America. 
I mean, right. this is not the American dream that my mom and dad told us. You know, growing up, I'm the youngest of three girls. My parents said, if you fight, if you're willing to work hard, you can be anything you want in life. Anything. The sky's right. the limit. And here, here we work so hard. And we were shut down for farming on our family farm when we're in full on harvest. I just, I thought whatever this nightmare is, you know, when is it going to end? And it got a lot worse because what, what the bad guys do, if they can't win um, on the facts, they will try, they will fabricate, they will lie. Right. They will, they will do everything they can. You know, nothing's off limits to win. And, uh, and I remember I did, I did, I did, an, I did an interview and I said, there nobody is taking my family off of this land. They can try to shut us down, overregulate us. I mean, the things that they did, the, the, the lengths that they went to to steal our farm from us. I said, until my last breath, I'm going to fight for this land. And we did, and we won. And, uh, you know, it's it's proof that if you're willing to fight back and you're and you speak truth to power, you can prevail. This is remin- reminiscent of Russia, Russia, Russia. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Demand inspections. They right. came in. They came in. They came in almost like you know, in the dark of night. Although it wasn't in the dark of night, but they came in and they photographed our personal private possessions. You know, demanded to look in our closets, climbed on our chairs to see what we had in the attic. I mean, oh my this gosh. is this is this. And we have video of it. I, you know, you know, oops, <laughs> did I lose you? Uh, We're here. Uh, I got you. I got you. You, <laughs> you just go ahead and set back up whatever yeah, you're ready. Yeah, we're good. We're good. <laughs> So we have Martha Bonetta on, and we're speaking about big government over over regulations and big government, and uh, and how real life fight back, and you can win. You can actually come back with this. And I tell you what, speaking of come back, coming back and winning, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the show. I guarantee you, the comment sections are saying that the deep state knocked your phone. Out. Yeah, the gotcha. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm the telling gotcha. you, the deep state did it. The yes, deep state did it. <laughs> Guarantee you. Okay, she's back on. Awesome. But yeah, no, so you're saying that if you stick in there, you fight <clears throat> through it, you get through it, truth will prevail. It's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort and probably, yes. unfortunately, a lot of money. And I know they prey on people because they have an endless yeah. bank account. What's Mueller up to? $39 million now? I, I mean, it's just endless. But here's the thing. Here's the thing I want everybody listening to, to think about. We were outnumbered. The government has an unlimited, unlimited coffers paid for by our tax dollars to bite us, right? Um, the bad guys are have more money than they know what to do with to bury you. But we had we the people. We started a tsunami. We started a movement. We started uh, having, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of demonstrations all over the state. We started petitions. We started, you know, literally, if you were running for an office in Virginia and you didn't support this legislation to help the small family farmer, you were done. You wow, know, didn't that's matter awesome. Of, yeah, didn't matter what side of the aisle you, you're on. You know, if, if you're running for office and you don't support, you know, small business, small mom and pop, small family farmers that just want to make a living and be left alone, forget it. You, you didn't have a chance of winning. I mean, both of our bills were bipartisan bills. Both of our bills uh, were unanimous on the Republican side. And, and you know, they were made to know that they would be held accountable at the polls if they didn't do what was right by the people. And that's what we have to do. We may be out outspent. They may have more money. They may have perceived more power, but guess what? They serve we the people. They serve we the people at the end of the day. And we were determined to hold them accountable. And that is exactly what we did. And um, I speak to people all over the country and help them have the tools that they need to fight back in, in their states. And we're going to keep doing that until until I can no longer speak. So, uh, well, and that's where the American so, American Priorities Conference comes into play. That's where this yeah, comes into play, where we absolutely. can connect, recharge, meet up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I say recharge, these events, folks, if you've never been to one, you absolutely owe it to yourself to do whatever yes. it takes to get to this one. This is going to be the flagship. This is this the first unique. one. This, this one's unique yes. because uh, you know, and the thing that really. I love the name American Priority. You can go to AmericanPriority.com to get your tickets. And I I think that the name says it all of the uniqueness of what this is. And I was just going to see if Martha would want to share with us what what American Priority means to her. Everybody has their own thoughts on sure. it. Yeah. And so what do you what what would yeah, you I say? Mean, for, th- for me, for me, I grew up in a, in a hardworking family. You know, my my um, my parents, you know, we, you know, 
they instilled a really strong work ethic in us. And they, they, my father served our country. Uh, we just grew up with a real love for our nation and a real love for what it means to be an American. And, uh, you know, my father, um, you know, having served, he'd been all over the world and, and he would tell us, you know, there is no place in the world he would rather live and raise his family than right here in the United States of America. And we grew up with such a love and respect and appreciation for our nation. And for me, it means making America first. It means making our veterans first, making our farmers first, making our citizens first, making our country a priority. And, and to me, it means, you know, that's what our forefathers intended. You know, they, you know, we, you know, Thomas Jefferson wanted our nation, our forefathers wanted our nation to be a the shining beacon on the hill. And, and somehow or another along the way, um, you know, there, there are those that would, that would throw American, uh, uh, patriotism on, 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 on the altar of greed, right? Or on the oh, altar yeah. of power. And they would sacrifice what our forefathers, what our veterans, what those that serve our country are willing to die for. They'll just throw that all away for whatever their agenda is, their agenda du jour, whatever their agenda for right. is. And, and for me, what it means to have to, uh, American priorities means, you know, making America first in every way. You know, we're open for America's open for business right now. Um, you know, companies want to come. They want to do business with us. You know, jobs galore. And it means really, you know, in everything we do, remembering why our nation was created to begin with and living up to that great, the great vision that our four fathers had in everything we do. And I feel so blessed to be a part of this. The people I've met, the friendships I'm going to have for a lifetime as a result of this. It's unbelievable. I'm really excited about it. So are we. That is and- incredible. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, you know, and, and you see in Donald Trump's actions, America is uh, coming first in his mind, his thoughts, his actions. America's first. You're absolutely right. I am excited about this this conference, and I'm excited to meet you in person when we get there. I can't wait. Yes. I cannot wait to see you guys. I've heard so many great things about you. Oh, that's so, so awesome. Excited. Don't believe a damn one of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> all good. All <laughs> right. And folks, follow Martha Bonetta uh, on Twitter at Paris Bonetta. B O N. Yeah, it's Paris, it's Paris Barnes because oh, my Paris family Barnes. farm. Whoops. Yeah, I want everybody to come visit us. My family farm is in a little town called Paris, like Paris, France, okay. Virginia. We're an hour and 20 minutes west from the White House. It's surreal. You leave the swamp, you leave the concrete swamp, you drive west, and all of a sudden you're in, you call it. Agricultural oh, that's, rural farmland, and that's easy to remember. So you're literally, you're the name literally means the physical barns, right? Yeah, in I, Paris. I, so we have an old historic barn. Okay, and, uh, it's really easy to remember. Paris, Virginia. Paris. We've got this big old barn and Paris barn. Paris so that's, barns. That's I was yeah. wondering. I was like, is, yeah. is is that like a maiden name, Barnes? No, no, it's literally no, no, a no. barn. Okay. It's literally Okay, yes. gotcha. Sweet. Paris Barnes. <laughs> awesome. All right. Awesome. We yes. will see you here in a couple of days. Thank you so much, Martha. I can't wait to see you all. And, and uh, I'll tell you, I, I love America, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I love this great country, and I'm just so excited about this conference. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys then. All right. All right. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye now. All right. Bye. Awesome. And you guys need to come out and meet her along with everybody else that's coming to this conference. I'm really fired up about it. I mean, this thing started off as just this little – like, hey, let's have a get together. You know, let's kind of make it like CPAC. And all of a sudden, it got serious real fast. All of a sudden, everybody's like, I want in. Well, so, when you say, let's have a little get together, I mean, this was only a few weeks ago. Yeah, it blew up fast. You know why? Um, I don't know if you guys know uh, um, Chris Barrett. You could uh, find him on Twitter. He's a, uh, got a blue check mark and everything. And he's uh, big into media and um, um, PR and all that kind of stuff. He does that professionally. And uh, he said that, you know, this is what's missing in the entire MAGA movement, this kind of conference. You know, we went to the um, Gateway, the Gateway Conference in in, uh, St. Louis, and we we kind of commandeered that, right? Yes. Like the people, our people, the MAGA people, the new right media type people kind of – you know, uh, descended upon St. Louis and we kind of took it over, but it wasn't our thing. And CPAC, much too big at the time for us to take it over and commandeer it because that's enormous. 
This is from the ground up a mega conference, and it's never been done yet. It's been talked about for a long time. I remember, dare I say, I think it was Mike Cernovich early on who said we need to have a a CPAC type of thing, but for mega people. In a lot of in a lot of ways, the new media gala was kind of like an attempt at it. So maybe in a way that maybe this is the the totally first uh, stab at it, but this is the first one that's like kind of being attempted on a professional level and it is it's very 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 professionally done and you guys will see uh there were some pictures that were sent to me of what the lighting and the seating oh, and the yeah. ambiance looks like absolutely and uh, uh, i i didn't share it because i didn't want to get in trouble because it might be a secret but oh my gosh is it beautiful yeah absolutely beautiful uh it's gonna be one of the things where um when you start seeing pictures from this thing and you didn't go. You didn't get a ticket. You're going to be like, oh, my gosh, I really blew it. That's such a loser. I blew it. No. Yeah, so yeah, definitely you get out it. there. All so. right, so we did Martha, Scott Pressler, and we're waiting for our third guest, Dr. Jane Ruby. Oh, um, I'm going to need a wire. I got the thing. I, I, Is need, she, I need a patch. She might be coming on, if you want to text her, she might be coming on. Vimeo. Oh, that'll be good. If you got her number. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. No say, problem. Say, check your DM on Twitter. I'll Brian, do that. Brian's got you set up. So while we're doing that, uh, again, folks, there's a lot of things that are going on. Let me let me hit one of the big things that have, has came out this week. If uh, you didn't quite see it, let's do, let's, let's do Obama. This week, Obama talking about the economy, talking about Trump's economy, this thing that's just rip-roaring crazy fantastic this is your uh ex-president barama barack obama who cannot get out of his way when it comes to uh and he's he's the first democrat that agrees with trump that the economy is awesome uh nobody else agrees with trump that the economy is awesome except uh, barack obama who's uh insanely jealous i was extraordinarily proud of the paris accords because uh look i know you know uh you know, I, I know we're an oil country, and uh, we need American energy. And, and by the way, uh, American energy production, uh, you wouldn't always know it, uh, uh, but, you know, it went up every year I was president. Um, and, you know, that whole suddenly America's like the, the biggest oil producer and the biggest guy. Uh, that was me, people. I just wanted you to. So... So, uh, <laughs> it's a little like, you know, sometimes you go to Wall Street and folks would be grumbling about anti-business. I said, have you checked where your stocks were when I came in office and where they are now? What, what are you talking, what are you complaining about? Just say thank you, please. Um, because, because I want to raise your taxes a couple percent. Because some of those jobs of the past are just not going to come back. And when somebody says, like the person you just mentioned, who I'm not going to advertise for, that he's going to bring all these jobs back. Well, how exactly are you going to do that? What are you going to do? There's, the, there's no answer to it. He just says, well, I'm going to, I'm going to negotiate a better deal. Well, how, what, how exactly are you going to negotiate that? What magic wand do you have? And usually the answer is, he doesn't have an answer. That's your former President Barack Obama. Uh, just absolutely so insanely jealous over the economy. Now, he said to the crowd, uh, just thank me. I mean, you're welcome. Uh, come on, man. Just, oh. Hey, what, what, what do you mean America was the uh, biggest oil producer? Yeah, that happened under me. What, what do you mean America's all of a sudden great again? That was me. I did that. I didn't build that. Well, what do you say you're going to You're going to make a deal? I did. Who are you going to make a deal with? Who are going to negotiate a deal with? I got a magic wand. <laughs> this is insane, folks. This is crazy, crazy. It's driving Donald Trump is absolutely driving these people nuts with how great things are becoming. And um, just some of the stats I was telling you earlier about that uh, 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 Rana, R-O-N-N-A, McDaniels, uh, she 
uh, mans the Twitter account for the Republicans. Uh, she t- tweeted out a handful of very uh, positive stats, things that were that, that are happening that you're that people are missing about the economy. Um, real quick, oh, there she is, Ronna McDaniel. Latest economic numbers show our economy is still booming under real Donald J. Tr- uh, Donald Trump. Lowest unemployment rates in 69. Consumer spending grew at a fastest pace in seven months. Incomes rose by largest amount in nine months. And something that she didn't add in there that I'll add in there. Uh, GDP was unrevised for last quarter and is holding strong at 3.5%, which is phenomenal. Uh, some of the other great news. Uh, Scott Adam says, at Scott Adam says, okay, tweeted out. See if you can find the news on CNN about uh, President Trump successfully persuading President Z to classify fentanyl as a controlled substance in China. It's the biggest news of the day. Has to be someplace. And so, uh, where's the, okay, here's the, for those of you who are on the video portion of the show, here is the picture of the front page of CNN. It looks like a little stuck. I'll show it to you anyways. All right. That's the front page of CNN, and there is nothing on there of the sorts. None of that, but you can't find anything where Donald Trump said that he is taking Air Force One and going to fly the uh, casket of George H. Bush, who, if you didn't know, passed away last night, night, night before, night before. Passed away. It was on the 30th. Yeah. Passed away the night before at 94. Um, you don't see anything about Donald Trump and all the great things that he's been doing this past few days. No, nothing about that whatsoever. Um, and that's funny. They got a, an ad for Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson at the top for March 26th, Forming Art. He's in a little bit of hot water. Is he? Oh, nope. he's being accused. Going up against some allegations. Oh, the Me Too movement. It's allegations Strikes coming again. after him. Well, it's Who not about it? the nature of the evidence. It's the seriousness of the allegations. Correct, correct. The seriousness. <clears throat> uh, John Cardillo, John Cardillo, he tweeted out uh, this. He tweeted out this headline, and I'll read the headline first, and I'll read his comment. <sighs> The headline says Trump fixed Obama's mess in oh sorry sorry hold on. that was what he said. The real headline said world's most competitive economy US regains the crown it lost 10 years ago. John Cardillo said the headline might as well be Trump fixed Obama's mess in 2 years. <laughs> yeah. I mean that's true. I mean that's the thing. <laughs> We were we were really distraught. We founded this program out of our. Uh, we were really really distraught about the the Nate. My my dad, he was he was gone. My dad said, "You can't save America. We're already off the cliff. We're just on our way down. We we haven't collapsed and and lost the country. It's not dead yet because it hasn't hit the pavement yet." But it, it's gone over the cliff. We, we, We're just on our way down. It's like your Bugs Bunny in that telephone booth. You don't feel the wind coming at you. And so uh, what <clears> we do <throat> is we just open up the door and you just step out at the right time. Oh, right. And you would be just fine. Do you guys remember that? Where he steps out <laughs> right before it crashes? And it crashes, but he's fine because he steps out at the right out. time. Right. <laughs> so, anyway, so the, the the wall got 10 feet higher. This is uh, by one of our, uh, uh, our buddies. Um Carpe Diem okay. on, on the Twitters. He put together this. On, donk him. Uh, donk him. Donk him. Uh, he put this together about the uh, wall just got 10 feet higher. This is the hypocrisy of the Democrats, uh, one after another, after another, after another, and then Donald Trump. Our immigration system is broken. Illegal immigration is wrong, plain and simple. All Americans, not only in the states most heavily affected, but in every place in this country, are rightly disturbed by the large numbers of illegal aliens entering our country. The people who should be here are those who come legally. We have to send a clear message. Just because your child gets across the border, that doesn't mean the child gets to stay. You have some very, very bad people in the caravan. You have some very tough criminal elements within the caravan. 
but I will seal off the border before they come into this country. And I'll bring out our military, not our reserves. I'll bring out our military. Ten feet higher. The wall just got ten feet higher. Try ten feet higher. I said the wall just got ten feet higher. Ten feet higher. The wall just got ten feet higher. Ten feet higher. I said the wall just got ten feet higher. I'm building a wall, okay? I'm building a wall. I'm building a wall, okay? I'm building a wall. I want to, I'm building a wall, okay? <laughs> nice. That's got a good beat to it. it I think does. we need to make that a uh, a full length song yes for it. absolutely <laughs> uh it's some great thing so when you go to the american priorities conference.com and you get your tickets or if you're at smithradio.com or smithtv.com and you see the the p the big giant p that has the american flag colors running through it click on that and it gets your tickets once you get your tickets you're gonna get to meet these folks that make these memes oh yeah and they're gonna teach you how to meme Teach how to do it or show this'll you. Be, this will be his first public appearance. I don't want to give him a little, <laughs> little, little scare or anything, uh -oh. but uh, uh -oh. this will be the first time he's uh, shown himself. Which is exciting. Yeah, It'll be cameras fun. won't be allowed. So, <laughs> oh no! <clears throat> you so, know he could still be incognito. He'll be there. What he probably has been to every one of these events. He just never knew. Right. He's, he's just, just some realized. guy off to the side that's like, hey man. You like this conference? It's cool. It's pretty cool, huh? And you don't even realize you're talking to one of the I'm, most I'm Brian. famous meme guys on the internet. I'm Brian. What's your name? Uh, John. Oh, hey, John. My name is Carpe. <laughs> Carpe? What? Carpe. That's kind of interesting. Okay. Donkum. Donkum. I said Carpe Diem. Mr. Because that donkum. is what it is, Carpe yeah. Diem. But Carpe Donkum. Is Donkum, is that Latin? <laughs> <laughs> That's Latin for seize the meme. Oh, Okay. I don't know. Maybe, it don't, don't matter. Know. We're Americans. We make this stuff <laughs> up on right. the fly. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so, so now that we're talking about the uh, the caravan stuff, let me get some of these things out of out of the way real quick, folks. We had some great interviews. Kind of ran a little bit long with a couple of them. Waiting for a third, very very special guest, Dr. Jane Ruby. When she's ready to come on, she just pop in and we'll go right to her. But here's some of the videos that you may not have seen this week about the caravan. So look at this guy through the fence here. He has what appears to be a brand new smartphone. And I thought they were poor and starving and hungry and they had nothing and were coming here for a better life. But look at this. Where do they get the money to have these sell these smartphones? Uh, well, I think these people are more like middle class and uh, they're radicals. They're the vanguard that came up first in the air conditioned buses that Soros or somebody else paid for. Wow. Whatever it was, folks. These, They're not that poor. Come on. No, they've got uh, cell phones and dressed uh, fairly well and um, flipping the fingers off and stuff and whatnot. And then you had what, what went down. Um, here, we'll do this as another real quick one. We've got, folks, we've got citizen journalists on the ground in Mexico. They're there on the ground in Mexico getting the real story. This is what I love about this, folks. This is why you support Smith Radio. Because it's it's folks like Carrie and I that can bring this to you that you may have missed. The hard-hitting journalism. <laughs> I, we find these guys. We follow the guys. The guys are following us. They, they're right. sending us texts, uh, showing us, hey, check out this video. Check this out. Check. And this is what's really going on in, on the ground in Mexico. I'm going to show you guys the food line. Okay, I'm going to show you guys the food line. You guys tell me. You guys tell me if this is the women and Mildred, children that the media is saying. Are these women and children? I don't care about the looks, to be honest. I don't. Okay. Wow. I haven't seen one woman yet. Lots of okay. young, younger I men. I haven't seen one woman yet. 20s, okay, 30s, men. early 30s, men. 20s. Men. Fighting age Look men. at the ages. Men. 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 Oh, they men. look well built. Men. I mean, there's people. Men. 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 Okay. Men. Men. There's like no women, no, no children. Men, men, men. They're men, all in line men, for the food truck. Men, 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 men. Where's the women? Men, 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 men. More, more, more. Men, 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 men. Oh, I haven't seen one woman yet, guys. Men, 
men. He's still men, walking. This men, is like a line men. at the let's, Trump let's rally. Let's for discussion's sake. They went chivalrous and let the women eat first. <laughs> <laughs> if I go any further, that's the end of, of the, the beginning of the line. Wow. I mean... I mean, that wasn't 4,000 people. He probably showed maybe a couple, couple hundred, a yeah. couple hundred maybe. Um, I, I didn't count, but uh, he certainly walked far enough to have surpassed 100. Um, could he have cherry-picked this? That's tough. That's tough. To, for, for that long of a stretch, to be only young men, built like pretty, you know, pretty well-built men, uh, not starving, not old and, you know, um, wheelchair bound or right. crutches or. Yeah, I'm trying to. There's just no way they are healthy looking, uh, yeah. working age men. Right. And I mean, am I missing something culturally? Is there something in their culture where the women uh, sit in the shade somewhere while the men stand in line for, actually, on, actually, on their behalf? No, Is no, it, actually, no. Uh, no, no. In their culture, women uh, labor uh, twice as hard because they do the babies and they do the work. Lots of laborious work. Oh, man. I hate to hear that. No, it's true. Oh, boy. Rough okay. Day. Another citizen journalist, real quick. These are only one minute clips. Another citizen journalist. She is on the ground in Tijuana. Uh, TJ for short, for those of you in uh, Westwood. That's what we call it down in SoCal. TJ. So she's there and she's uncovering that there's supposed to be a march on Tijuana and a march okay. on the border. And this is what she found what, out. So a march the, in Tijuana on, on the, border, the border on behalf of like the caravan? Right. Okay, okay. And they're supposed to organize. Uh, there was a time set, a rally point, and they're supposed to make this thing happen. Hi, so we're right outside um, Benito Juarez once again where there was a march planned for about 11 o'clock. Um, the leaders of this caravan uh, are trying to get the march kind of going but uh, a lot of people over here are very angry they're saying no we're not going to march to the line again we know that they're not going to let us into the united states and their frustration um they said they're saying right now that they feel frustrated that they have not been told the truth um they feel like they've been misled uh, to come here to tijuana right uh, thinking that the united states uh would have to let them in they or were that told they would that. Just present their card from Honduras, and if they had a legitimate, legitimate asylum claim, that they would be let into the United States. But they and don't, they're upset and they and know they're they don't. They're not going to march today because it's not safe. It's not safe for the children, and that's what's going on right over here. There's very, very few legitimate asylum claims. And by the way, if you know how asylum works, you can't do it from Honduras. No, you and they, have to seek yeah. asylum in Mexico, and only if you're denied. In Mexico, could you even have any chance of being granted asylum in the United States? Right. And Donald Trump worked out a deal with Mexico that the asylum seekers would stay in Mexico while waiting their claim for asylum. They're saying now that the numbers are 90 percent of the the, 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 the documents they've gone through. Ninety percent don't even warrant a look through for asylum. So so. You're not saying 90% are being declined. Are being declined. You're saying that 90% don't even get to smell test. They don't get to be checked to see if they get declined or not. No. They 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 failed the pre-check. The pre-check and the pre-check is <sighs> what is your asylum? A lot of them are saying I look for a good job. I don't get a good job. No, and they're like no, getting a good job in America doesn't uh, that's not asylum I don't, seeking. I, I, since I can't get a good job, I need asylum. Yeah, that don't work. Well, I need asylum somewhere. <laughs> I need asylum too. <laughs> oh, don't let your boss hear that. Oh, oh no, them is jokes. No, I oh, love my, oh. I love my job. Okay, I love my job. And so, and we also had on uh, this week on the border, we had the tear gas. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, b briefly, I guess they fired some tear gas canisters, and, and they were, and they were prominently pictured some women holding children their uh, mothers holding their children right. and running away from the tear gas and so is that is that a thing yeah that's kind of a thing well uh gateway pundit actually had a picture and uh took the, the there's a huge wide picture of the woman with the two babies mm -hmm. that were pantsless and shoeless and they had like a, a diaper on but brian you tell me because you have young children mine's getting a little older so i kind of forget these things 
Didn't they look a little old to be in diapers? That's a uh, third world country. That's I mean, they look the, like they were like three, four right, years that's old. That's the coddling. And I, it's, it's, it's what I've seen. Okay. It's, right. it's the lack of discipline and the lack of rules and regulations. And, well, it'll just, uh, you'll be out of diapers when you stop uh, pooping yourself, I guess. That's I've seen that okay. way too often. Oh gosh, uh, where, where where kids are wearing diapers at three and four, four years, five old, years old, five years yeah. old. They're uh, something something got stalled out in the development if they reach three and they still have to wear diapers. There was a woman we knew, uh, I knew her very very well in Southern California. That uh, her daughter, she had another baby. Uh, so she was she just had a newborn, mm-hmm. and her daughter was around four and five years old. Okay, and uh, walk into the living room where all the adults were talking, <coughs> lift her shirt up, and uh, she's hungry. Okay, and <laughs> which just kind of weirded me out. I'm like, what's that all about? You mean like she was showing her belly, like it's empty. No, oh, no, no. The the little the five year old yeah went to the mother and lifted the mother's shirt up so she could get something to eat. Wait, you mean like breast? <laughs> yes. Oh my god! I I was There's, told I'm by down. a mother, a very wise mother, when you know it's time to stop breastfeeding, and that is when the child asks for it. Yeah, she was asking for if it. The, if the child uh, verbally asks. For and no, and nobody, the milk, nobody then in this, it's, it's getting too old. And nobody in this culture found that to be odd. Oh wow! So okay, I'm, just, I'm right. just saying. So okay. So the tear gas and whatnot. Uh, Gateway pundit Jim Hoff had a big wide shot of the mother and then the entire background with the fence, and he pointed out that there were three to four different cameramen set up with three to four different displays. Of what was going, it was like reenactment time. It was like the Civil War reenactment, different camera crews in different spots, and then right in the middle of it all was a group of people that just weren't even moving. Yeah, they were just kind of hanging out, like just oh, chilling. Get the camera out, man. This is the photo op opportunity. Something like that. Yeah, he's like, well, we'll get you when it's your turn. You guys just wait right here, okay? Oh, it was a line of people. Uh, it was a casting call. Yeah, the, it was a, a cattle call. Oh, cattle okay. call uh, for the casting couch. Okay, so, <laughs> well, here's the thing. Uh, real quick for those of you who are not – and Brian would definitely be able to um, give a lot more detail on this. But a lot of times – I'll never forget when Jason, my brother, went to a casting call for a commercial – you know what they did? They had all these kids lined up. This is when he's very young. And they all did the commercial. Every one of them. They all uh, they were they had to reach up in the air and grab for a bag of potato chips. They all did it. They were all filmed doing the commercial. This was it wasn't to see whether or not you get chosen. Literally everybody did it and at the very end after they had all the kids filmed doing the commercial, they picked the one that did the best job. Yeah, pretty much that's what it is. So in this case, they have everybody run from tear gas, or so we're told. By the way, I didn't see any tears. Like, tear? <laughs> they anyway. Somebody had a smoke bomb, and the wind was blowing a small stream of smoke across the desert plains. Okay, kind of like, uh, they try to make it look like the mustard gas of World War One or something like that in the trenches. It looked like but... a really bad Chrysler, you know, pumping oh. out some white <laughs> I some could white see that. smoke. <laughs> I could see that, or, or some sort of a... Uh, Cold War era Soviet uh, vehicle. Oh, wow. <laughs> trying, to, trying to get up a hill or something. Yeah, or but, you go. So they were basically just going to record everybody one at a time. And at wow. the end, this woman carrying her two diapered five year olds. She made the cut. She made the cut. All the rest of them were cut out. Yeah. Okay. So, I can see that. so Dan Bongino and uh, Geraldo Rivera. Are both on Sean Hannity's show, and Geraldo is getting, uh, he's going full board. Uh, like, he has just gone so, so wrong, so bad. Dan Bongino puts the screws to him. You gotta hear this. 
Yeah, you know, Geraldo, again, I, I appreciate your nice comments. I consider you a friend, too, but you are way, way off base on this. Of course. I've stood at roll calls. I was a law enforcement officer. I'm not looking for anybody's pat on the back. Your tax dollars paid for it. It was a great job. But I ask you the same question Sean asked you. You're given a lot of platitudes. Nobody wants to see anybody tear gas. You win. Point stipulated. We're both, we both are empathetic to that. But that was not the choice of the Border Patrol officials. The choice choice was made by people who stormed the border illegally. And I ask you a very simple question, and I would sincerely appreciate an honest answer. You're standing in the face of these Border Patrol agents patrolling our border, just doing their jobs to keep our nation secure. What do you tell them to do when a rock comes at their face? What? What's your answer? You, nobody produces an answer. You, they you just don't. Produce you don't. What do you, you do? Don't. This is what you do. This is what you do not do, Dan. You do not shoot. Tear gas I didn't ask you what you don't do. Children. I asked you, do you what you do. And you, 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 and you, you, and you and Sean. You and Sean. All right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You and Sean Hold are both answer. the grandsons do do? or the great grandsons of immigrants. Oh, boy. Yeah, they didn't throw rocks. Irish immigrants. They were slandered my just like you were slandering these people with these, with these, Paula, with these. Uh, my and, wife Paula is an immigrant. They have diseases. They're bringing disease. They read the no, newspapers from listen. the middle of the 19th century. The Irish were bringing diseases. The Italians You're were bringing diseases. The question. This is a slander. Why won't you answer the answer. Answer. They did, actually. That's why they had Ellis Island. The what you don't do is you don't put do 6,000 do? GIs do you do? with what fixed do you bayonets do? at the border. What do you do you, when they are when they are our agents? All right, all right, here's what you do. You send Spanish-speaking ambassadors to the crowd. You explain to, to them that they are not face? going to be able to rush the serious? border. You Show explain the to them the facts of, of the right, charges. You serious, explain to them you? the reality of what's happening. There's hundreds of charging at this. This is a stain. Right, well, okay, hold on. Now. now they're showing video of uh, police in Mexico <laughs> with riot gear on the the full face shield, the the big giant body shield, as well as the helmets and all the gear. And they're showing how they're being overrun at the border. For those of you who listen audio only, Trump presidency. Geraldo, that there be are very hundreds to charging the border. And charging at police. What if it's thousands? What do you do then? That's an important question you need to answer. Are you are you going to believe those you words? Talk are you going to them? believe your own lying eyes when you look at the what lying eyes? You know the, he is such an idiot because for him to look, they were going to storm the border if they weren't allowed to cross, and that's why they stormed the border. Right, because they were told they can't come. What does a Spanish-speaking ambassador, who's going to tell them, guys, and this is in Spanish, I'm going to do it in English. Hombres. I'm going to, tran I'm going to translate it for you. Guys. Hombres. You're not going to be allowed to cross here. No se puedo. <laughs> so, what, what, I don't know. What does no se puedo mean? You can't do it. <laughs> okay. okay, so no se puedo. How is that going to fix it? What, because they're speaking their language? Is it a language barrier that made them decide to storm the border? Like, hey, I don't think that they're, um, I don't think they're going to stop us. I don't think that we're not allowed to do this. I don't think that, uh, I think it's okay. Let's go. Why did they have to run? Why, you know what? And they were chanting. They were chanting on the border, si se pudo. And si se pudo, si se pudo, meaning, yes, we can. Yes, we can. We okay. can do it. I say, uh, no se pudo. No, you can't. I'm sorry, all man. All right. So I'll go back home. And, and that's what's why, with the rocks? But that's why they're all upset too. They wouldn't even go on the march. Geraldo insulted my ancestry by basically comparing them to people who feel the need to throw rocks at American officials. Could you imagine? Uh, you know, my Irish ancestors and German ancestors didn't come over to Ellis Island and start assaulting American officials. They just didn't do that. And by the way, the reason they came to Ellis Island is because they brought disease. And the Ellis Island was, was there so that they could filter out the ones that did and didn't have disease. And the ones that were diseased, were tr it was an, there was an attempt to bring them back to health. And if they succeeded in bringing them back to health, then they eventually let them in. The ones that were already healthy, they would let them in, uh, assuming they, they passed any other kind of vetting. But the ones that were diseased had to be in, you know, in an infirmary or whatever there, uh, quarantined until they were brought to health. 
the whole purpose of Ellis Island was because they were bringing disease. So for him to say that that they're being slandered because it's being said that they're bringing disease is an outright outrageous lie. And it's actually slander against anybody who is pointing out the facts. If I point out the fact, hey, they're bringing disease. We need to maybe quarantine them to make sure that they're, well, that they well, don't get through that have diseases. Well, we have facts. Facts on the ground are showing there's people with hepatitis. There's people with jaundice. There's people with HIV. And there's people with uh, full blown AIDS. There's all kinds of, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if somebody said that they, that somebody had leprosy. I'm just saying, I wouldn't Whatever be the diseases are, they were bringing them and they need to be quarantined. Now, were all of them diseased? No, but if, if more than a very, very small percent do, it would be extremely irresponsible to not take them all and treat them all as if they're diseased and then one at a time find out which ones are healthy. And <laughs> if it's been shown that they're healthy, then then move on from there. But obviously uh, treat the ones that aren't or send them back. And people died at Ellis Island. Because they were, they were, they had uh, uh, fatal diseases, and so it's it's a slander to anybody who points these facts out that we are slandering immigrants because we're calling them diseased or that they're bringing diseases. Of course, they bring diseases. Yeah. Do all of them? No, but they're a part of a population of people that are bringing over diseases, and it would be extremely stupid to not. At least start by treating them all as if they were diseased and well, then you, weed out the ones that aren't. Yeah, you err on the mm, side mm. of caution. Right. America first, people. We need to protect American citizens by starting off by treating them as if they're all diseased and then having them prove their health to us before we pass them on to um, asylum seeking or whatnot. And of course, they're breaking law anyway. Right. And not only that, but Donald Trump said this week, first and foremost, I granted uh, uh, the Border Patrol. I gave them the green light to use force if need be. So good, good, good to go. Green lit. And uh, did you did you remember that the, the uh, tear gas in 2013? I assume that this was the first time that they've ever used tear gas, right? Now, no? Britt Brit Hume retweeted something out on Twitter. Britt Hume, tear gas was used under Barack Hussein Obama. Where was it? Britt Hume and uh, Britt Hume. This is from Thanksgiving weekend 2013. Remember all the howls of outrage over the use of tear gas? Me either. Border Patrol crowd confronts agents. A group of about 100 people try to illegally cross the border Sunday near the San Ysidro port of entry, throwing rocks and bottles at U.S. Border Patrol agents who responded using pepper spray and other means to force the crowd back into Mexico's officials said. And Susan Schroeder and Elizabeth uh, Aguilera November 25th, 2013, at 5.55 p.m. I'll tell you what. Um, I mean, deadly force as far as I'm concerned. Did you know that one of the rocks killed a Border Patrol agent this past week? You were telling me about that. I mean, now. this is why you just got to go ahead and, and probably start firing uh, lethal weapons. I mean, it, it, if they're throwing rocks, it's what you got to do. It's right. as simple as that. Judicial Watch is on the ground doing what they got to do. Judicial Watch released 224 pages of documents with 1,000 summaries of significant incident reports from HHS revealing unaccompanied alien children processed under the Obama administration included murderers, rapists, smugglers, prostitutes, and human traffickers. That's from HHS. That's from Obama's HHS. That's from Kathleen. Was that right. Kathleen Sebelius? Well, and the thing is, so we're talking about alien children being um, well, trafficked. When, when they say alien children, there was one that was uh, in his 20s. Oh, right. And went to the high school and was raping girls and molesting yeah. them in the girls' bathroom. There's mid 20 year old uh, illegal aliens that people are just assuming are children. Uh, or underage and need schooling. They send them to high school. I'll tell you what, I, I went to, uh, no, nobody listening, 
I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and call it out. Nobody listening. I went to a, a middle school that was a lot like um, that movie Lean on Me. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was my middle school for the most part. And one of the things that they would do, since I was an inner city public school product, <laughs> is uh, when when the kids got out of prison for uh, doing whatever kind of murders and whatnot that they that they were doing, when they got out of prison, they had to resume the schooling where they left off. So we had like 17, 18, 19 year olds in middle school with 12 and 13 year olds. Oh, and they would bring knives and brass knuckles and and uh, it was it was pretty scary, pretty scary. And uh, so anyway, I digress. <laughs> Uh, this is what they have to deal with. This is what what the school systems in Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas have to deal with when they don't really know and can, have no way to really confirm the age of these people is that they, they're in their mid-20s. Do you want uh, your daughter, your 13, 14, 15-year-old daughter going to school with a 24-year-old guy that's doing whatever? Right, got no morals, no scruples, no nothing. Right, uh, lawbreaker. MSNBC, MSNBC <clears throat> is going to fire another reporter because of how uh, truthful this one's being. Apparently, Benny Johnson at Benny Johnson, MSNBC anchor gets completely wrecked by their own reporter on the ground covering the migrant caravan, and this, according to the Last Refuge number uh, two, with the number two, Last Refuge two. Remember that genuinely good reporter who went into the New Mexico terrorist training compound and showed how badly the FBI were covering up the issues of weapons, tunnels, etc.? Remember that guy? Well, MSNBC has that guy back on, and he's down there with the migrants in the caravan. And, uh... This, this is because some us. people look at these images sure. and they listen to the president who says it's not women and children, it, it's stone cold criminals. So my first question is, you're in that tent camp. Besides that family, give us the profile of who is there mostly and what are they looking for? Because it seems as though, to your point, they don't actually have the necessary information so they know how to cross the border. There could have people, there could be people yesterday who were running because they thought it was their only chance. Yeah, this woman is desperate to get these people across the border. Desperate. This, I'm, I'm say leading the witness. Yes. <laughs> Right. And it's very difficult because this has become such a polarizing issue. If we kind of take a walk, you'll, you'll be able to see for yourself. Again, this is the inner sanctum. Okay, now there he's walking past a carnival-style tent. Yeah, you're not carrying a tent like that with you. Somebody set that up. What, what kind of cost would that something like that? I mean, that would be know. hundreds of dollars to rent and to Just set to that rent thing it. up and set it up. Right, right. The shelter. Uh, so uh, you're, you're going to see a lot of families here, a lot of uh, women and children. Uh, but the, the truth is, the majority of the people that are part of this caravan, especially outside, if we can make our way all the way over there, uh, we'll show you the majority of them are men. So uh, when this becomes a polarized political issue in the United States. You have people on one side uh, that point and say there are women and children here. And that is true. And then there are others who point. There are hundreds of porta potties mm -hmm. lined up. Hundreds of porta potties, and say uh, these are are men that that are trying to cross the border, and that's true too. Um, from what we've seen, the majority are actually men, uh, and wow. some of these men have not articulated that need for asylum. Instead, uh, they have talked about you know going to the United States for a better life and to find work. Uh, but if we come this way here, we're just gonna uh, leave. This is where where there's a, a food bank that's set up, and you've got a long line of men. Earlier, we saw about five six hundred men standing in line waiting for uh, food and it looks like that's dwindled down but this is the outskirts and we're going to pass through here i'm going to show you where there are some uh there are some police officers and uh and this is the this is the outer perimeter this is where we're starting to see uh a large 
portion of uh, police that are forming up on each side of the caravan. So uh, this is the outskirts over there. Way down by those trees, there are police, many police in riot gear. And we don't know if they are here to actually protect the migrants, uh, which is another thing that we've heard because there are people here in Tijuana that want these migrants to leave or they are here because they may make some sort of incursion into this shelter and try to remove Wow, that was uh, something that MSNBC certainly did not want to be reported. Wow. So what do you know about getting wrecked on camera? She got wrecked. So, and another thing, Charlie Kirk, at, at Charlie Kirk 1-1, ICE just arrested a criminal immigration attorney. She was found guilty after purposefully lying on hundreds of asylum cases. She lied about their criminal histories falsely alleged persecution and forged multiple signatures. Maybe this is why Democrats want to abolish ICE. Yeah, ICE doing their job. Well, you know, I I try to simplify things down to their simplest elements, you know, all the way down, divide it down to the simplest terms. And the reason Democrats want to abolish ICE is because ICE is the human force that's propping up a border that and, and the Democrats want to eliminate borders because John Lennon's Imagine is their, oh, uh, their is their theme song. That's their theme song. Imagine a world with no borders. They think that borders are what cause wars and that somehow, by the way, there were no borders in all of North and South America when the entire continents, both continents, were completely populated by Native Americans, and uh, they were warring all the time. Not only that, but now they're done because they had no borders. Yeah, they had nothing to defend. They didn't believe in uh, land ownership and all that kind of stuff, or at least uh, a lot of them didn't. And uh, But the point is, is that uh, it, it, human beings are territorial. It's why... The, the the John Locke philosophy, the Enlightenment philosophy is life, liberty, and pursuit of property. They had to change it to um, uh, pursuit of happiness. Life, life, liberty, and property changed it to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness because of the fact that we had to deal with a slave issue. Yes. Um, but but it's but it's supposed to be life, liberty, and property. If you take away the fact that, if, or if you if you if you understand that human beings cannot be property, right? Well, uh, I mean that's what the Republicans did. We we right we established we that we yeah, fixed we that. Fa- yeah. So now that we fixed that, we can go back and resume to life, liberty, and property. Right, and that works. The Enlightenment philosophy works. It's been proven time and time again. And uh, part of that is borders. Um, you know, separation of different cultures into uh, areas where people can. Uh, pursue their happiness All right so. absolutely real quick so i don't forget this is just a little tidbit of things that are uh, a good good going good with america uh something that happened this week uh there were videos and pictures of north korea and south korea uh walking across the dmz shaking hands for the first time since 19 19- in 68 years that's the first time that's happened in 68 years it is unbelievable what Donald Trump has been able to do with North and South Korea. They're meeting with each other. They're tearing down their walls. They're tearing down uh, 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 towers. They're doing all kinds of things to make the right steps. However long it takes, they're actually making the right steps uh, in the right direction to, for peace, prosperity. Uh, you know, you inject that North Korea with a little bit of capitalism. I'm going to tell you right now, people are going to get a taste of that and not want to let it go. That's for real. Um, something else that's going on is the uh, Daily Mirror. Or, oh, that, this is one that kind of made me mad. This kind of popped up today. Daily Mail UK uh, headline, hilarious moment. Trump wanders off the G20 stage before a group photo op and leaves Argentinian president on his own before he's caught muttering, get me out of here on a hot mic. Trump shakes the guy's hand up on stage. It's a big, giant, wide open stage. Okay. And then as he does, he waves and he looks off the stage and all of a sudden, which the camera doesn't show, but we caught this on information on the back channel, 
people showed up that Trump was supposed to meet with. And they finally showed up. Okay. Right after he shook the, uh, the guy's hand. He said, go oh, ahead, hey, right? And he, he walked over there and he did say, I mean, it sounded like Trump's voice. The camera wasn't on him, but he'd say, all right, all right get me out of here. All right, get me out of here. Yeah, get me out of here. Okay. And the the president of, uh, uh, what, what did I say, Argentina, he made it awkward. He stood there and he he looked up and looked around and then had his back to the camera. He just, what am I supposed to do here? My handlers are gone. <laughs> Donald Trump making it happen. He's got things to do. Yeah. And, and you know, him saying, get me out of here. I wouldn't want to be hanging around those fake liars much longer than I have to. Donald Trump making the world safe again, making the world great again. Everybody's wanting to come to the table, and he ain't got time for everybody. So get me out of here. <laughs> he probably said that to Secret Service. All right. right. Get me out of here. Get me out. Hurry up, too. Right. So Get I the lead out. I don't know how I don't know how they claim that to be hilarious. Um, well, who, who was, who was the butt of the joke? Argentina president, right? Uh, they tried to, hilarious moment, Trump wanders off stage as if he's going see it. Dude, they're trying to pull oh, Reagan on him. I see what they're, they're doing to, here. To 25th pull, Amendment, yeah. the whole nine yards. Okay. Pulling a Reagan. Don't you think for one second that they're not going to start trying to pull some kind of, cause he's 72. Uh, you get a little senile, a little crazy crew. No, they can't. Tr- That's what they did to Reagan. Yeah. Um, but was, didn't he end the end? Right, hey, that don't make no noise. Okay. Mind. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just leave it there. Cause we don't know. The fact of the matter is, is that even though, uh, Reagan ended up, uh, dying of Alzheimer's, but also, you know, Alzheimer's is a long disease and all this kind of stuff. There was speculation that he was, um, suffering from it pretty heavily, even while he was president. Nobody knows that for sure. Totally speculation. I haven't had a doctor tell me that. I mean, they have their own private physicians. Uh, you would have to be the doctor that took care, of him. took care of him that would have to come out and say, yes, he uh, was out of it the last two years of his presidency. He didn't know what was going on. But that hasn't happened. Right. It has not happened. Uh, something that uh, if you got a box of tissues, you might want to go ahead and grab them right now. I'm going to have some uh, here come the water works. Oh, no. Some tears are coming. Oh, no. Bill and Hillary Clinton's 13-city North American tour designed to provide Hillary with a platform to influence the upcoming Democrat primaries has been canceled. Oh, no. Is due, it because of her health? Due to poor ticket sales across the country, the series of live shows billed as an event with the Clintons was also set to line the Clintons' pockets with yet more cash According to the source who told the American Mirror that Bill and Hillary Clinton's 13th city headline tour has been canceled. Wow, what a legacy they, they, they've left the behind. First, the, wow. first, the first event they opened up to 83% empty seats. Oh, uh, you know. <laughs> um, how is anybody surprised by this? It's like the people that love her, love Bill. And by the way, Bill Clinton, for those of you youngsters out there, he was unbelievably popular. In fact, the Monica Lewinsky scandal actually made him more popular. And when he was uh, busted for lying to Congress, it was like, that's why we love him. We love him because he lies and he's a good liar and, and he's just trying to get a little, he's just trying to get a little something on his side. He's trying to get something. And by the way, look at Hillary, wouldn't you? You know, yeah, that, yeah. that literally was their, was their argument. And, uh, and I should say our argument since I was, uh, yeah, I had to walk away. I had to walk <laughs> away. I had my hashtag walk away moment <laughs> back in the day. Back in the day. Back in the day. Um, but th- that was the argument and, he was enormously popular, and had Bill and Hillary done a tour like this back in the early 2000s, it would have been very, very popular. They would have sold very expensive tickets. They would have sold a lot of them, and they would have made a lot of money. But, you know, the Me Too movement, the fact that Hillary is just the most vile, detestable, hateable person. Uh, these millennials? 
The millennials? They didn't know. You all just found out that yes. Bill Clinton's a rapist. Right. And that's the thing. People who were older are kind of like, they still remember how much they loved Bill and, and that kind of stuff. But but this new generation was like, Bill Clinton, I know he was president. What can, what do we what was it all about? And then they find out like everything about him. They're like, oh my god! Yeah. So Epstein, so, Epstein, what, what, Lolita Express. Oh yeah, it was oh. just a disaster. And so this new generation is like, we had a president that was doing what? Yeah, full blown rapist. Yeah, full blown rapist. And that's another thing too. He was a serial rapist. That's another very important thing. We all knew about Juanita Broderick, and we all knew about all the other women. Kathleen Willie and Juanita we, Broderick. Well, we, we had Juanita on the show. Yeah, we had Juanita on the show. We all knew about her, and we all knew about the allegations. But it's only recently that we can all say, he actually raped these women. Yeah. The, back then it was kind of like, oh, you know, was he was doing some, you know, he's cheating. Like the big scandal back then was... Oh, he cheated on his wife. That was the scandal. Now we look back and we're like, cheating? Nobody's even talking about that. The fact of the matter is, he raped these women. He's a, we had a president who was a serial rapist. And back then it wasn't, that wasn't even on the table. Now that we see that, you can't be selling tickets and, and expecting big sales. People don't want to go see a serial rapist and actually, Give him money and reward him with riches for this stuff. And Hillary enabled it. Nobody ever thought of it back then as enabling. It was like she was the victim. Oh, poor Hillary. She has to put up with this guy, this horrible husband. She's a martyr. She's like a, a marital. For staying with him. Yes. She's yeah. a marital martyr. And look how brave she is for staying with him. Right. And now we look back and we're like, she enabled this. She the knew what thing. he was doing. Yeah. She knew he was a rapist and she covered for him. And how did she cover for him? By attacking the real victims. Bimbo attack. Bimbo so, eruptions. So all God, of this is crushing. karma. It's all coming back. It's karma. Absolutely. 100% karma. Uh, you could say it's the universe. I say it's God. Whatever you will. You'll get it in the end. Yep. Yep. So on to people that need to get it in the, the need to need. get it in the end. Yeah, because it's almost over. Oh, OK. The show. OK. The Mueller investigation this week ramped up and everybody oh, so forgot funny. about the MAGA bomber. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Sam tweeted out this week. Said, hey, y'all. What's wrong with y'all? Y'all forgot about that MAGA bomber, uh, didn't you? <laughs> I'm gotta, I've got a little confession to make. Because, uh, I, I I, mean, as far as I was concerned, they seemed like a plant. It was just too perfect. Uh, the, the van and just everything it was just too perfect. The fact that the bombs were intentionally designed to be pretty much completely harmless. And because they were destroyed, evidence destroyed... We don't even know if they were actually a danger at all. Yeah. At all. Yeah, this is Sam's tweet. New media. And obviously That's talking us. to us. Yeah. New media. What happened to fake bomb maker, crazy van guy? Asked the seven agents taken into custody in three different states this morning. <laughs> at Smith Radio, at Brian P. Smith. They are trying to hide the truth. I don't know. There's a lot of s really scandalous stuff going on here. There's a lot to be said about that. And I, as you my know brother me, would say, I am a a uh, anti conspiracy theorist. I like to debunk them. Actually, that's my favorite pastime is debunking conspiracy theories. But there's a lot of funny business going on here. Very very funny. Hey, whatever happened to the guy who uh, the Benghazi filmmaker? Nobody knows what happened to the guy that uh, safely discharged a firearm into Comet <laughs> pizza, pizza. Comet Pizza. Uh, nobody knows what happened to him. How about Tank Man? Tank Man. What's Tank Man? Uh, in uh, um, the, the, the Chinese Square. Uh, t t oh, t he's, t he's living his life in an island somewhere. How do you he's, say uh, t t t Tenement Square. Tenement Square. Yeah. Oh, he's uh. They gave him a, a mansion in a island in a tropical island somewhere. Google Tank. Man. 
That's his name. Oh, he's according to the uh, Chinese authorities, he's fine. He's fine. He's no, no, he's good. No problems here. He's good to go. So, as you live in a banana republic, as we we're feeling like that this week with the Mueller investigation ramping it up. All kinds of people going to prison, all kinds of people getting accused and pe- people making plea deals. Apparently, uh, this this had to do with Don Jr. Apparently, NPR embarrassed the hell out of themselves this week. Oh, yeah, this is bad. Forced It was forced to issue a lengthy correction Friday, this by Fox News. But it was delayed, like, really bad. But go ahead. Yeah. After falsely accusing Don Jr. of lying to the Senate about plans to build a Trump Tower in Moscow, claiming a statement contradicted Michael Cohen's plea deal with special counsel Rob Mueller, the public radio network, which we don't need it anymore, paid for by the government, taxpayer dollars. government propaganda. Right. Public radio network, which receives federal funds, used Don Trump's Senate testimony transcripts in 2017 to report that he said... The Trump Organization poss- possible real estate deal in Russia faded away by the end of 2014. The eldest son of President Trump then denied the deal was being discussed in 2016. Quote, there was never a definite end to it. It just died of deal fatigue. See what they're doing, folks, and what they've done to Cohen, what they're trying to do to uh, Junior, what they did to General Flynn, what they did to uh, Michael Cohen. And what they did to, uh, who's the other one? To, uh, Papadopoulos. Oh, boy. They tried. See, there was Political no, prisoners. There was no crimes committed until Mueller started asking questions and tripping people up on time. We need a constitutional amendment to protect citizens from this kind of abuse. Flat out. This is the kind of stuff. This is this is just one thing where the, the FBI is creating criminals out of law-abiding uh, innocent people in the way it's like system. It's a system that creates criminals. It's like the IRS and rush rush points this out all the time, right? The IRS. I don't care how clean you think you are. Oh, right. Yeah. You think you're doing your taxes, right? It's I'm going through H and R block. I pay a guy. Yeah. You pay a guy and yet you're still responsible. Could you imagine having a job where you get paid to prevent somebody from going to jail but if you fail and they go to jail you're you're okay. still good to go you're, you're good to go <laughs> you're good to go oh my so god so if they want you for something the irs can get you on there's too many rules uh donald rumsfeld yes that's wrote, who it was that's who it was <laughs> he wrote a letter to the irs it was an open letter so yeah. he, he sent it to all the different news outlets uh to the irs saying I did my best. I don't know. I <laughs> in all honesty, this is is factually correct to my best ability. Yeah, and the thing is, is you could send all of your financial information, every single sliver of all your financial data, records, whatever, to ten different tax preparers, and you'll get ten different tax returns. And 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 you have to pick. And so what what Donald Rumsfeld would probably have to do, or what Sean Hannity would do, is he would take the one where he uh, where he owes the government the most. Then he would pile on an extra couple foul. Oh, man. Sean Hannity <laughs> tells his accountant to to tack on a couple extra thou. Uh, give them more. Like make, he's make sure we get this so right. It's. Wrong, right? He's he's literally donating to the IRS in order to prevent from going to no, prison. No, he's paying <clears throat> off the IRS. Yeah, he's it's, paying them off. It's blackmail. It's blackmail. <laughs> it's hush money. Yeah. So so that's the system. And here's the thing: this kind of abuse is what the colonists were enduring from the British government that led them to not only um, do a violent revolution, bloody revolution. Uh, and the Constitution, but also they there were there were uh, representatives who said I'm not signing on to any government crap. <laughs> uh, as far as I'm concerned, the states can go their separate ways, unless you include a Bill of Rights that basically tells the federal government that you can never do this to people. And even to this day, the federal government is like, Yeah, I know it says that. I mean, yeah, I, I know it says that. I mean, but who's going to hold us to who's going to hold us know. accountable? It's just a suggestion. It's just right. a suggestion. And by the way, those words they I don't mean the, what you think I, they mean. Carrie, I know it's there. I know it's there. Yeah, 
that don't make no never mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so no, so my point is, is that you look at what the IRS and, of course, in this case, the FBI and all this stuff. We need an additional amendment in the Bill of Rights to protect the citizens from a system that creates criminals out of innocent people simply because they want these people to be guilty of what they want them, what they're after them for. They're after them for something specific, and they want them to be guilty of that. And when they find out that they're not, they've created a system to get them anyway. Right. By creating... And that's what's, a new crime. Right. And that's what's happened. They're, the crime that all these people are committing are lapse of memory and time, exact moments of exact time frames. And they tried to nail Donald Trump Jr. by saying that you lied to Congress about when it ended. And he said, no. The damn thing ended under yeah, fatigue. Like, it was under fatigue. It ended. Yeah, it just was, disappeared. There was also, uh, I don't know if it was Don Jr., but I was listening to about somebody uh, getting busted for lying to the FBI because they said that something, they don't remember something that happened. Um, and it turns out that there's an email from a long time ago. Oh, you're talking about uh, Corsi. Yeah, Corsi. Yeah, okay, you're talking so about Cor- Corsi. Corsi is going to fight this. So, so here's, listen to, hear me out here. Nobody's making this argument. This is an exclusive for Smith Radio. This is my logic. And I think it needs to be seriously, um, it needs to be incorporated into our principles of America. And that is that if you don't remember something and the government finds out that had you remembered it, then you would have answered yes. Like, for instance, uh, Brian... Did uh did you um did you take out the garbage um on garbage night five weeks ago? I don't remember. Or or let's say five months ago. Nah, on garbage night. I have no idea. I don't, so I Brian don't says I don't remember uh forgetting to take out the garbage. Say they find a text from yes. my wife yes. thanking me for taking yes. out the garbage. Okay, so <laughs> here's my point. Here's my point. <laughs> I don't think – you know how they, they say innocent until proven guilty. They have to find – if you're accused of something, even if you actually do it, if you say, um, I'm not confessing to anything, they can't just convict you. They have to find the evidence that proves See, These people reason. need to start pleading the fifth. Well, no, here's my point. My point is I think that we should adopt a new philosophy. I think that it's already there. I just think that nobody's looking at it this way. That you can't be, you can't be convicted of lying about anything that you say you can't remember. You can't prove that then somebody I don't, remembered then I don't something. Remember it, right? You cannot. It's the human mind. The human. You cannot say, Brian. You told me that you don't remember whether or not you took out the garbage six months ago on garbage night right, on no, this I, particular I, date, and yet. We have found a text message from that very day that we questioned you about it, showing that you did take out the garbage and you knew you took out the garbage. <laughs> and yet you sat there you the audacity. under oath with your hand on the Bible. May God strike you down if you lie. And you said, I don't remember forgetting to take out the garbage that night. And you did remember. No, you can't say whether or not he remembered. I think a principle needs to be adhered to in America. If we want a just and free America, where if somebody says they don't remember, then that's it. You just have to leave it there. Now, if you want to go back and say that Brian, because Brian took out the garbage on such and such a day, that proves something else. And you ask Brian, Brian says, I don't remember. And you find out that he did do it, even though he doesn't remember, because the text proved that he did actually do it, and that proves some other criminal activity. Fine. Go after him for that. But you can't say, oh, you put your hand on the Bible, and you said you didn't remember, and yet we found a text that shows that you did, and so we contend to you, uh, your honor, that... He did lie about not remembering. We need to cut this clip of this out and say Mueller sends man to prison for lying about taking out the garbage. There you go. 
That's what that little segment was right there. Going to prison for not you can't for, for saying I don't remember taking out the trash, and it was proven that you got a message from your wife thanking you for taking out the trash. Now, now here's one caveat: What if the night before you took out the garbage, and then the next day you're under oath, and the and the FBI agent says, Brian. Did you take the garbage out last night? I, I believe the fifth. Well, couldn't you say, I don't remember. And then when they find out that you did take out the garbage and there's proof, proof, they come on, man, it was 24 hours ago. And you're telling me you don't remember. Oh, man, I was sleepwalking. I don't know. I know I didn't late. I, I think I Brian rests his case. I don't know. I was sleepwalking. Johnny Cochran, where's he at? I need old Johnny. Dig him up. Uh, uh, the Chewbacca? Okay. The Chewbacca, Chewbacca defense. Oh, gosh. All right, real quick, let's run through this. We're at the end of this thing. Donald Trump tweeted out, lightly looked at doing a building somewhere in Russia, put zero money, zero guarantees, didn't do the project, which hunt. Not only that, but it would have been 100% legal if Trump did a deal uh, for a hotel in Russia. It would have been legal. It would have been legit. It would have been correct. And there would have been no illegitimacy about it. He could still do one now if he felt like it, but he's not. This proves the witch hunt. Uh, <laughs> Cohen, this by Breitbart News. President Trump blasted Michael Cohen as a weak person on Thursday, accusing him of lying after news emerged that his former lawyer made a plea deal in the, uh, uh, the Mueller investigation. Quote, he was convicted of various things unrelated to us, right. Trump said, as he addressed reporters before board, uh, boarding Marine One headed for the G20 summit in Argentina. Cohen pleaded guilty Thursday of lying to Congress as a part of a plea deal. The president went on, quote, he was given a fairly long jail sentence and he's a weak person. And by being weak, unlike other people that you watch, he's a weak person. <laughs> I'll just read it word for word. Is that word for word? Yeah, he's all a right. weak person. Like a couple of run-on sentences, sentence Pre fragments. Uh, sentence. It's all good. Trump said Cohen is lying, quote, lying about the project that everybody knew about in order to get a reduction of a sentence. I mean, we were very open about it. We were thinking about building a building, Trump said. We decided, I decided ultimately not to do it. There would have been he, it, it nothing matter. wrong if I did exactly. do it. Exactly. It doesn't matter if he did or didn't. This is such crap. It's basically trying to get the public to imagine if he did this as president. Yeah, this is being tried in the public, the, the realm of the public. Uh, the present. Yes. The present. It's, it's being like, tried you, it, it's, in the public square. It's it's it's. Tricking you into thinking, well, this is the president of the United States. He's been president for two years and he's trying to do business in Moscow. No, this was back when, before he was in thinking about and being I, president. I, it don't even matter what the date was. It is irregardless, which isn't a word of what the date was. I don't see like how the old folks use that word. Irregard ir irregardless. Irregardless of what's, what, what Brian Irregardless said. of what and, I was saying. I just think it's funny. Anyways, no, it don't make that. Come on, man. What are we talk about here? So Ryan Fournier, don't look now, but 18 months and $49 million later, special counsel has just figured out Donald Trump builds hotels. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, he he builds hotels and he builds uh, international hotels. He builds them uh, overseas. I think he has them all over a, a bunch of countries. Mueller now knows this um, and has uh, found this to be factual evidence of this. So uh, some of the details that I heard about was that Donald Trump, uh, uh, some of his uh, people were deciding that if we were to give Putin – a very, very, very expensive, multi, multi million dollar apartment at the top of this uh, hotel, apartment, whatever it was, and for him to live, that this would sell. I guess it was probably an apartment because sure. he was selling condo, whatever. A condo, yeah, whatever. Uh, that uh, it or, would, or a, f a flat. It would pay for itself because every oligarch in Russia would want to live in the same building that be able to brag about, I live in the same building as Putin does. And uh, that sounds like good business sense to me. I don't see 
the the idea that this would be collusion that would require the impeachment of Donald Trump is just a bridge way too far. And for anybody who is buying into this, I got to tell you, you're being duped. And don't be an idiot. (laughs) Don't be an idiot. Don't be a useful idiot. Think for yourself. Use your brain. Um, Try to imagine what business people do and how it works and how logically this is not – and this is a big nothing burger, flat out. So someone who follows us, we follow them. I I don't know who it is. It's C underscore C3 underscore C. I have no idea what that means. Yeah. Okay. Uh, But tweeted out, Hillary paid for the dossier. Page – Carter Page is not – is not a Russian spy. Okay. Papadopoulos didn't uh, talk about emails. Musfud is a Western intel. Mm-hmm. That was the okay. um, that was the uh, the, the Maltese uh, professor. And uh, Cohen didn't go to Prague. Hey, by the way, folks, they 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 originally thought that Cohen was in Prague. With Russia, that's yeah, why they nabbed I Cohen. That. Yeah, and, and how how did they nab Cohen on that? Because they were doing Spygate, looking through the 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 the, the back end, trying to find a name, and the name Cohen is a common name apparently. And they found that a Cohen had visited Russia. It was the wrong Cohen. Oh gosh. Oh, talk about Keystone Cops. Oh, that is awful. Manafort never met Julian Assange. Stone and Corsi, who we were talking about a second ago, weren't Assange's contact. Don Jr.'s meeting was a Fusion GPS setup. Right. But Trump is crazy for calling this a witch hunt. That's an awesome tweet. I need to find that guy and follow him. C underscore C3 underscore C. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, uh, it's like C C three C with uh, spaces in between. It's underscore, underscores, underscores. Yeah, yeah. so um, that's at some uh, Twitter handle. Yeah, and so I, I put, wow. in the show notes. Papadopoulos reported for jail on Monday for fourteen days based on not getting his dates correct. Papadopoulos is we we the American people are now safe for two weeks. Wow, Papadopoulos is under lock and key for two solid weeks. We're Don't safe. let him. Don't We're live. safe because he has been removed from society. Right, Come he, will, on. he will not be allowed to go. They did it so he couldn't go to the American Priorities Conference. Yeah, yeah, he was going to be a speaker at the American Priorities Conference, and by the way, his wife will be his there and there. speak on his behalf. So we will be welcoming. And her. this is this is breaking news too: uh, the Comey plea deal. Apparently, Rod Rosenstein knew about the Comey plea deal days before um, uh, the new uh, acting Attorney General Whitaker. Which violates protocol. Of course it does. Because Rod Rodenstein has directed his whole damn thing. Anyways, and this is coming out. This I'm just going to play just a little bit of this. This is going to blow your mind. Next couple of weeks, this is going to just, oh. Well, here's an interesting story you may not have seen. FBI agents raided the home of a Uranium One whistleblower. That's according to a new report by the Daily Caller News Foundation. A man called Dennis Nathan Kane has turned over documents to the DOJ, as well as to the both House and Senate Intel Committees. The documents allegedly show that federal officials failed to investigate possible criminal activity involving the Clinton Foundation and the Uranium One deal. Now, Kane says the FBI repaid him by sending 16 agents to raid his house for six hours. Okay, then he had Dan Bongino on, but we're out of time, and Dan Bongino just lays into it. Here's the thing about this. This guy was a whistleblower for the Uranium One deal because he worked on the deal with the Clintons. He whistled blue, said this wasn't right, got the documents to DOJ, got the right to the right people. Kind of like, uh, you know, uh, Seth Rich going to go meet with the oh, FBI. Yeah. And 16 agents raided his house in the middle of the night. He's lucky to be alive. That is true. Dan Bongino says, from his point of view and from his law enforcement point of view, do not trust anyone no. on this. This might not be bad. This might be good. This might be awful for Hillary. This might be bad for Hillary or good for Hillary. We don't know yet. He said so. So until we find out, you can't it, trust it, anybody, right? And it is very, it is very suspicious that these events happened. He whistle blew, and then sixteen F- FBI agents, and we know we can't trust. Raid is suspicious on its face. These people need to be arrested. Deep state needs to be arrested. We need justice. All right. And then we got Sarah Carter on with uh, uh, Sean Hannity. This is a minute long. This is going to blow your mind. All right. Now, 
there there are, are there's something percolating that probably will break Monday. Do we either it's want possible. you're both smiling. Do we either Monday, want, you want to give yep. the audience well I'll a give little you some heads up. I'll give you some breaking news right now, Sean. Just two hours ago, federal prosecutors assigned to John Huber, the U.S. attorney investigating the Clintons, reached out to a whistleblower in the Clinton Foundation. The first time we've seen contact between a Clinton Foundation whistleblower and that particular federal office. That just happened tonight. What? Are you talking about the one whose home was raided? No, this is a, this is a different this is whistleblower one. that you might learn. You'll learn a lot more right, about so on Monday, I bet you. Oh, All right, we'll not learn that on Monday. Sarah, last word. What is it? I, I Give just us say a we preview have to keep of Monday's eyes. coming attraction. <laughs> I, I think we've got a lot to look forward to on Monday, Sean, and I think that the American people are going to see that there was happening behind the scenes at the FBI as well as the Department of Justice, and Michael okay. Horowitz have been doing a very deep dive into this, and there's going to be a lot of breaking news in the next month and the months to come. Okay. What? Everybody stay tuned so, on Monday. You gotta, gotta watch Hannity's show. Oh, God. Man, we need a teaser like that for our show. Dag nab it. Well, I'll be able to watch his, uh, or listen to his radio show on tomorrow. I, th- he's probably gonna give some stuff tomorrow, so I will tweet that stuff out for you guys. Make sure you follow me at Smith Radio. Come and see us at the American Priority Conference. Go to AmericanPriority.com. And also, uh, and come visit us in D.C. this week. Go to patreon.com slash smithradio and, uh, and, uh, and support if, us. If you want some good gear, some great gear, we got the Trump 2020 Smith Radio t-shirts out. Go to the, just go to the website. Smithradio.com, right? Yep. Or awesome. smithtv.com. All right. With unfathomable power. What kind of power? Unfathomable. It's unf- without fathom.